Yes, here we go. We've got a Jambos legend. Not only played for Hearts, but also broke a few hearts in his time. Gary Lott. <laughs> <laughs> How you all doing, mate? All right? All right, pal, aye. You're yeah. looking great. You look like you still play. I wish I could. If the, if the knee would hold up, I'd maybe have a wee chance. But, uh, nah, I'm delighted to be back at the club. You know, I spent a lot of great years here. And uh, when Anne brought me back as ambassador, it's, uh, I'm losing a couple of the wrinkles and that that I got when I was a manager here. So... Uh, great to be back. You're looking trim as well, do you keep yourself? I try and keep myself fit. I do a fair bit of spinning and all that. Um, I struggle you know, with, the, with the playing side. You know, my mates are always at me to play five sides and all that, but twisting and turning is no for me anymore. But running in a straight line or, or cycling, I'm not too bad. Just get you on the ball, mate, innit? That's it, pal. Never That's mind it. But I've got your player, manager, and now on a fucking jolly up as a club ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> what is a club ambassador, come on, tell me? I, no, it's, um, I think they're becoming more and more popular. Uh, I see a lot of ex-players now that are getting roles like that at clubs and basically I'm kind of involved in everything here when Anne brought me back to the club eh, obviously it was a great time to come back we were building this new stand that we're sitting in at the minute um, and it was exciting times and basically she says wanting you to come in kind of be the face of the club help with the players with certain things eh, in terms of like personal appearances all that type of stuff eh, help with the local schools charities and then on a match day you know, try and get some ex-teammates back along to the game, go around the, the hospitality suites, make sure everybody feels welcome at the club and that. So it's been a great role so far and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Brilliant, mate. Uh, always, as you said, an affiliation with Hearts. Hearts fan growing up or Hibs oh, fan, was it not? Oh, massively. <laughs> they were, uh, I didn't get on too well with them growing up, to be honest with you, but uh, I think... Uh, Bonnie Rigg, like, wasn't it? Bonnie Rigg, Bonnie Rigg guy, Bonnie Rigg boy, brought up sort of council estate there, massive Hearts area. Uh, so me, my, my two brothers, my dad, we went everywhere with Hearts, you know, say, if we probably two, three-year-old. Home and away? Home and away, everywhere. Um, as I say, never really missed a game, went on the Dardarol Hearts bus, uh, but there was a huge contingent for Bonnerig went on that, and uh, we never missed a game. And obviously, in that time, for kind of 78, 79 season, all the way up to kind of when I played 90, 90, early 90s, i never seen us winning anything, eh? so I thought, you know, I've supported a team that's not the greatest, eh? but it was brilliant, you know, it was brilliant watching Hearts, seeing us getting promoted, relegated, and generally felt I'd never ever see us winning anything, <laughs> but fortunately for me we did. <laughs> How were you picked up perhaps, just playing with a local boys club? I played with, I started off at a team called Panda Youth Club in Mayfield, eh, just where, where I stay. Uh, and I played up there at under 10s and I went into Hutchie Vale and, and Edinburgh. Oh, you Hutchie Vale, were you a massive club? Massive uh, boys club, still a, no, a brilliant boys club now. And he uh, came right through with a guy called Paddy Dolan who was no, a brilliant coach and probably one of the, the sort of early influences on my career apart from my dad. Paddy was brilliant with his. Uh, and then I started kind of training with Dundee when I was 9, 10 year old. And probably the last club that I actually started training with was Hearts. Uh, kind of went for years floating about the Celtic Rangers. I used to go down to like Man United in the school holidays and I was like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? How come Hearts have not have not had a look at us? And then kind of 11, 12 year old, I went to a, t a tournament down at East Easter Craigs throughout Glasgow and uh, Ian Grassick, the Hearts scout at the time, gave my dad his card and never looked back after that. So you had that. to go to Glasgow to get a trial It was like a <laughs> tournament with Hotchie, yeah, we Aye. played like tournaments all over the place. And we went through Easter Craigs and uh, played with Hutchie in that tournament. I did all right in the tournament and then Hearts, Hearts kind of scouted us that day and then I came in, started training with a guy called Kenny Brown and then never really looked back after that. Was it 92, 93 uh, you first started getting in the first team? Was it Joe Jordan in the manager? Uh, Joe was, Joe legend, was gaffer, eh? Eh? he was gaffer and uh, he was brilliant. He was the first manager that I kind of worked with that changed the whole kind of culture. You know, he had obviously played in Italy and when he came in, it was like, the boys would start to eat differently, we'd train differently, pre-season was completely different. Uh, so I seen a, a kind of another side to, to football that I'd probably never ever been used to. And then Sandy Clark was obviously a huge influence on, on myself, Paul Ritchie, Alan Johnston, mm. um, Alan McManus, all these boys, Kevin Thomas, we all came through with Sandy, he was, he was brilliant. And it wasn't until Joel left that I actually made my first team debut, but I learned so much under him. So you just on the debut, obviously being a big massive Hearts fan, what, what do you remember? Did you know you were going to play or was it...? No, I was on, I'd been on the bench. Um, myself and Alan Johnston were supposed to go to New Zealand. Um, under Joe. Uh, basically, it was, it was a three-month jolly. But he wanted us to go and, and play in New Zealand uh, over the summer. Right. And you know, Joe was... You know, uh, he was like, you need to go, it's an experience that you'll never forget. So I'd actually... I mind I'd set up a bank account and everything to go to New Zealand. Uh, and about two days before we were due to go, Joe 
uh, got sacked and Sandy Clapp took over. So the morning we were supposed to fly out, we got a phone call from Sandy saying, you're not going to New Zealand anymore. You and Alan are in the first team squad for this weekend's game against Airdrie. So obviously, you're, can, my, my whole dream growing up, can young lads will say now, oh, I dream about playing with Barcelona or Real Madrid. Mine's was simple, it was like a dream of playing for Hearts. So I was kind of was made up to help my dad and I, the whole family was made up. But they were at the games anyway, so they were all here. And I was on the bench, we drew one each, and Alan scored. He made his debut that day, didn't get on. So I was obviously gutted Got at, the, at the end of the game, but I was like buzzing the fact I'd been on the bench for the first team. And then the following week, we played St Johnston last game of the season. And I remember Derek Ferguson saying to me, you'll make your debut today. He says, because I'm going to come off. For you? So just to let you get on. Brilliant. And, uh, what a guy, Derek. Oh, Derek brilliant, honestly. Uh -huh. What a player. Uh -huh. Like, growing up, you know, I, I loved, I loved like, watching Fergie every day, you know. And, and I was always a central midfielder as a kid. So I, I kind of tried to model my game on him. See, and on the guy you are, see, when you were a young kid, were you chirpy with the first team or were you quiet? When I first came in, I remember my first day here, like yesterday, I come in. And obviously you're buzzing, Hearts fan, heart, young Hearts lad and that. So I came in and it was during the close season. And we had a physio here, Alan Ray. It was an absolute maniac, right? So his job at the time now, you've got like youth coaches and that. He basically took care of all the young lads when you came in. So I've came in my first day. There was only a big boy, John McCaffrey, was on the treatment table. And the boys, I can't mind how they were in the end, but I was the only young lad in. And uh, I was sitting and Alan says, right, no training today, but I'm going to give you a circuit. So I'm like, all right, magic. So he's gave us a circuit and I'm looking at him going, I don't know a fucking clue what a burpee was or anything <laughs> like that. So I says to Big John, he says, what's a burpee? And he's like, stand on that. It was a big, like, it was a beam, right? He says, put your foot on it and touch your toes. So I'm doing this, right? And Alan Ray's walked in and he's like, fuck are you doing? And I'm sitting going, eh, doing a burpee. He's like, that's not a fucking burpee, you idiot. So he's getting down and give me 20 press ups and that. So it was horrible with me, right? Absolutely horrible, yeah. made my, my day a misery. So I went home, my dad's like, ah, right, how is it? And I was like, oh, I, fucking, I hated it. I said, I didn't want to go back. Yeah. He's like, nah, you need to get your finger out your ass, you've got to be a bit braver than that. So I've come in the next day, and Alan was a completely different person. He's like, how are you doing? All right, did you enjoy yourself yesterday? And I'm like, how can you be so horrible to me yesterday, yet you're so nice to me today? And what it was, it was just testing your character to see if you could handle a wee bit of stick. And because I went in the next day, he's like, right, aye, well done, you did all right yesterday, you did a few jobs and all that, welcome to Hearts. So that was a, it was an initial sort of grounding for me yeah. that you have to accept a wee bit of stick, because if you can, eh, you'll, you'll crumble, especially at a big club like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the grounding we got at Hearts under Alan Ray and Sandy Clark stood us on in, in great stead for the careers that we all had. Because the manager who's here now was also a player as well, Craig Levine. Was aye. he different to how he is now? Because he might, he's might be a hard bastard. He's male, he? aye. He's, he was, well, I've seen that for myself. <laughs> and he laid out by Coggy in the uh, were you there, right? aye, I played that night. Honestly, I was just a young lad at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, I need out Craig will regret that uh, when he looks back at his career. But it was like, it was a friendly. And uh, Kim Big Coggy just kept heading the ball. And all of a sudden, Craig just turned around, <laughs> bang. And at half time, you're just sitting there, Hoggy's lying with his nose all over the place. Big Craig's obviously sitting there, gutted at what he had done. And uh, Tommy McLean was the manager at the time. You're sitting like, what's happening here? It's a friendly, we're doing nine men. Uh, but, you know, it was kind of something that it happens a lot. You've just been yeah, there yourself, you know, on training pitches. Uh, people lose their rag with each other. You get the odd fight now and again. But again, it's, it's kind of part of your part of being in a team, part of the team spirit, everybody wants to win. Uh, but it was a night, it was a night I was kind of just breaking through, so it was, I couldn't believe what had happened. Craig Levine would to always be on you? Aye, but he was a captain. He was a captain here and uh, yeah, it was great with, with us as young kids. You know, he was always obviously encouraging you. But when you go in the first team, you know, it was, it was a matter of winning. Okay, that, that's one yeah. thing that kind of disappoints me a wee bit now. Is I hear all the time, oh, you've got to enjoy it, you've got to enjoy it. But, when you get into the first team environment, you only enjoy it when you win. Because if you didn't win, managers get the sack. If you didn't win, you get moved on to another club. So you've got to win. And that was one thing that Craig, Dave McPherson, Gary Mackay, Robbo, Al McLaren, all these boys, they were brilliant with us. But when you go in the first team, you learnt, you learnt quickly, you couldn't make mistakes. Do you think that's why you went and had the career you had? Because of that grounding you had the as grounding, a kid? The grounding I had here, I would never change. And you know, I know we've got to move with the times and all the rest of it. 
but it never done me any harm. You know, Sandy was really tough with us. He came, we had jobs to do here. We'd clean the terrace in on a Monday morning, which was honestly was kind of horrendous. Well, even when you were in the first team, was that even, even with the first team, I you play the I play the first team on Saturday. Monday, I was in the shed picking up like sort of crisp packets that were in the urinals and that, you know, with bare hands and it, honestly, it was, you'd come in minging. <laughs> you'd have to be ready to shiver for about four hours. <laughs> but it was like, if you didn't get your finger out and want to be footballers, you might end up, you know, sweeping the streets or picking up litter or working with the council and that. So it was a, it was a brilliant grounding. And I think, and it gave you a responsibility as well. Okay, we all had jobs to do. And if we didn't do them properly, you know, Sandy would have the lot of us out, out in the pitch, doing laps of the pitch. Mm -hmm. It was basically, if you make a mistake, with your job or on the pitch, you've got to cost your teammates, so you've got to learn. And, uh, you know, I think we've got to, I'm not saying go back. back, go back to that, but have young lads taking a wee bit more responsibility as youngsters because you didn't really see that now. As you mentioned, uh, like his teeth, Joe Jordan lost his job that season, uh, replaced with Sandy Clark. What was it you think Sandy Clark seen? I think he's, he's seen somebody, also was a, a big hearts man, and any player says it, they were winners, but I genuinely, you know, even for a young kid, I used to, if we got beat, I'd be greeting for about two hours after the game. Must have done a lot of crying, eh? Oh, all the time. <laughs> well, especially watching Hertz when I was a young lad. And uh, because we'd been so close all the time, you know, when I got into the Hearts team, I was like, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to win something, not just as a player, but as a fan. You know, I was a huge fan. The only thing I'd seen Hertz winning was the 10 at 60s, eh? and even that, I think it was my dad went on a bender for about two days. <laughs> and you're sitting going, 10 at 60s, so surely we can do better than that. And then I'd, I'd been at the at Dens, 86, I'd been at the Airdrie semi finals, the St Mirren semi finals, where we were expected to go and win. And we went to the cup final against Aberdeen and that, and you're like, I'm never going to see Hertz winning anything. So when I got into the first team, it was like I was doubly de determined to try and win something because. We kept getting told that see if Hearts win something, it'll be unbelievable, you'll never believe it. But when, you know, obviously when I got into the team, we'd never ever won anything, we'd always got so close. Um, so when I got in the team, we all had a determination to try and win something. Chick Charnley said that Sandy Clark found it tough with big characters. Was it, was it similar here at Hearts? No, I think because when Sandy took the job, he had obviously played with, with Robbo and, and Big Slim, Al McLaren and that, and then he brought all of us through. So that was kind of the nucleus of the, of the team that Sandy had. And obviously we had we all had huge respect for Sandy, and he was he was, he was a, I thought he was really unlucky here because he put all, all the young lads in, um, and we, we we didn't have a brilliant season, but the, we certainly showed that we were improving. And I think the last twenty games we were unbeaten, um, and then when he left, you know we were all we were all devastated. You know you see now managers come and go all the time, and you look at players and. It doesn't look like some of them are bothered, mm. which for me, I think, I think it's embarrassing. You know, if you're playing, it doesn't matter if you like the manager or if you don't like the manager, you should be getting your best shot every week. And we did that and, uh, you know, we were gutted to see him go, but he had, he had uh, huge respect here for the fans because he, he was a brilliant player for Hearts, Sandy, but he was a, he was a brilliant coach and he had, he had brought a lot of success here with the, with the young lad. Uh, and, you know, I was gutted when he left because we genuinely felt that if he'd, if he'd got another couple of years here, we probably could have maybe something. won something before we actually did. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned John Robertson as well. We've had Ali McCoyston who said that Robertson was top class. Aye. How good was he? Oh, he was a phenomenal finisher. It was just unfortunate, Robbo, I think, at the time where he played here. You know, you had, as you said, you had Coyston who was unbelievable for Rangers. Then you had McAvery, Morris Johnston, Alan McAnally. And you, can you look at the strikers Scotland had? And then that's not even mentioning like Robert Fleck, boys like that. Mm. Yeah, but Robbo, any type of finish was unbelievable, like right foot, left foot, header. Uh, and you knew that if we got a chance, he would score. It was a, it was a nightmare at times to play against. And you'd be running by him to go and close a fullback. And you'd be like, fuck it, any chance. He'd be like, <laughs> shut up, just get the ball in the box. And I'll, I'll get you your win bonus. Uh -huh. And sure enough, I remember a couple of games out there against Hibs. I've had the, I mean, the worst shot in the world, sclaffed it, it's landed at his feet two seconds later, bang, in the net, and you're sitting going, that, that's why he doesn't run about, because mm -hmm. when it comes in the box, he was as good as anybody, and I, I genuinely feel that if he had played with a Rangers or a Celtic, I was delighted he never right enough, he probably would have scored 30, 40 goals a season, easy. How, how was he, like, see when your delivery wasn't good in the box, would he slaughter you? Oh, aye, ha hammer you. And he used to crack up at me and Alan quite a lot, because a lot of times I would just give Alan the ball, and he'd be like, oh, you, you little f have a look up. 
it's his arm because he was brilliant in his feet right. as much as you know a lot of people didn't give him credit for that see when you played the ball on his feet he was really strong keep it, uh, he did have the fast ass in the world too he was alright that one <laughs> yeah, but he'd back into folk all the time hod it in and then like Alan could maybe run off him or a midfielder Gary Mackay was brilliant he would run across the face of him and get in the box um, but aye he wasn't, he wasn't shy in letting you know but he was great for us you know him and his wife at the time Tracy they really looked after us you know his Saturday night uh, he would always take us out on a Sunday morning Tracy always made us a lovely breakfast so you'd stay at John Robertson's oh, house after the night out? stayed in his house I mean, I had, he had a house the size of Edinburgh Castle West, so <laughs> all, the, all the boys had a room each <laughs> probably, who'd always be on the night out would it, would oh, it be the full team or would it just aye. be a select few we had a brilliant team spirit here uh, but obviously all the young lads we all came through together so you had like myself, Alan McManus, Kevin Thomas, Paul Ritchie, Alan Johnston, and then you had like Robbo, Neil Point, and Nipper. Uh, we all loved, we all loved like playing football, but we all liked to be night out every now and again. So, it was, I had, my first flat was basically just across from where my mum stayed, and like you'd have the boys running about the street at three, four in the morning, and all that. I've said, "Gone, ah, I need to move." Okay, my mum's at the window, seeing like some of them running down the street with no clays on and all that. So, right, we need, I need to move first. So I need to get get away so she can't see all this misdemeanor. And then we'd, uh, we'd end up at Robbo's, where uh, we all had a wing each. So oh, brilliant! It was eh? brilliant. Yeah, and, uh, it was uh, great times because, like nowadays, you know, you know yourself in a team, you have to have a laugh away from football as well as you know at the training ground. Uh, but we wouldn't have got away with half the stuff that we got away with, you know, in the days. Would managers encourage you to go together, sir? Aye, they, uh, they back did. In the day, they did, did they? Sa Sandy uh, and the gaffer, Jim Jeffries, he, he was a big believer in, you know, no drinking all the time, can it? We didn't go out and get absolutely smashed all the time. We'd go, especially when I was captain, we'd always maybe go go karting or paintballing or we'd go down to England and take a game in and that mm -hmm. because I felt it was important for. for just the boys to get to know each other away from the training pitch because you, you know what it's like when you're at training it's all football, football, football but when you get away you maybe talk about different things which uh, which I felt was Bugs really important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you say Sandy Clark got sacked and uh, Tom McLean followed how different was he to oh, Sandy? It was, it was, it was diff completely different obviously t Tommy came in and uh, you know I didn't really play much under Tommy you know I had I had huge, huge respect for Tommy, like I did every manager, but, you know, I wasn't playing, so, you know, I, I tried my best. Why didn't you win the play? Probably, when he came in, my first game, we were up at Aberdeen, and uh, we were getting beat 1-0 at half time, and he's just looking at me and he's like, see you son, you're maybe a big hearts man, but you're shite. <laughs> <laughs> Get in the shower. So, after that, I generally didn't play for months. <laughs> and I'm sitting going, but again, we, we plugged away, we, we won the reserve league again uh, that season. And towards the end of the season, I think he obviously thought, you know what, they're not as bad as maybe what I thought initially. So myself and Alan and, and Kev, we started to get a wee bit more game time under them. But by that time, we were really struggling. Um, and we came in the last sort of two, three games and we just just avoided relegation that season, which for, for Hearts was an embarrassment. Mm. And we shouldn't be fighting relegation. Uh, and then obviously that summer, Jim Jeffries came in and, and everything turned round again for me. And the jet arrives. Yeah, what was your right, first impressions right, of him and Billy Brown? Ah, brilliant. They were, what I loved about them, they were honestly two of the hardest boys you, you could work for, like in terms of standards. But they were brilliant with you. See, if you, if you turned it on and you, and you worked hard, you might, didn't have to play well all the time. As long as you gave it everything you had, they would have you every day of the week. If they ever seen you slacking off, my God, it was unbelievable. What's the worst you've seen him crack it? Oh, it was the semi-final with the Scottish Cup. We played, we Gar Gary Naismith will tell you this. We were playing in the semi and he was getting a hard time for Kevin McCaster. So he's come in at half time and he's grabbed wee guys by the throat. He wouldn't get away with it, that <laughs> way. He's got him up here and his wee legs are like this. <laughs> he says, if we get beat today, it's fucking your fault. <laughs> he says, you better get your act together and all that. He went berserk. And then uh, there was an half time we were on our great run, nearly top of the league, and we played St Johnston, I think it was a Monday night. And we actually won the game 3 2. And we joke, we were in the dress, <laughs> we were in the dress, it was about half 11. Right, and he's gone berserk, he's let everybody down, you've let the fans down, that's not acceptable, I'm not accepting that as Hearts manager, you are better than that. And I'm sitting to filters, and I'm like, can we win? <laughs> and he was gone by his right. filters, he's like, start taking his strip off, gets the shorts and that off. He was a character and all. Uh, goes into, the, goes into the shower. 
<laughs> Jeffries goes through, basically picks him up with the neck. Naked. Sit there and he's like, Gaffer, I just want to go home and see like, the Waynes. Eh? That's how he, oh, I just want to go home and see the Waynes. <laughs> he says, it's quarter to twelve. <laughs> and he's like, you'll sit there until I'm finished. And that was like the respect that we had for him. Mm -hmm. So we'd won the game. And I think the wee boys in Johnston Grounds, we must have been saying, can any chance of him going yeah, home tonight? Uh -huh. But that was what him and Billy were like. They had set such high standards, but brilliant management team to work for. I mean, they were so... So good with the What boys. was the good part? How, how did how did they get the best out of you? How did he get the best out of you? Just confidence. Just confidence. His man management was second to none. He, he knew how to kind of get you going. Like I remember like one game at Hibs, we were we were winning at half time, two 0 I think it was. It was doing at Easter Road and he's coming. So you you're going in, you're two 0 up Derby, you're like bro buzzing. He's like, see you. Even the Hibs groundsman says you're shite when you play at Easter Road, right? And I'm sitting <laughs> going. I'm doing all right today. <laughs> he's like, fucking rubbish. And he kind of went right through me. So obviously I'm like, ah, fucking, I'm going to show, I'll fucking show him. So I've gone out the tunnel and he's saying to Big Davey Weir, and I'm like, am I, do you think I'm playing bad? He's like, I think you're doing all right. I'm like, fuck, he's fucking out of order. So we went in the second half, we've won the game, everybody's buzzing it. And it's probably the only derby that I never went out after the game celebrated because I was raging at the fact that he thought I'd played badly. Yeah. So on the Monday, I was like, can I first have a word? Like, see on Saturday. He says, I wasn't, it. I wasn't it that bad. He went, I know you weren't. He says, but at 2 0, see if they score, they're right back in it. So me and Billy are thinking, if we go in at half time and we praise you, all, he's all go out and think you've cracked it. So if I have a go at like you and Big Davy and, and Filters, I know that I'll get a reaction for you. So then I've walked out his, his manager's room thinking, aye, aye, he's right, aye, Kevin, <laughs> delighted again. Yeah. But at the time, I was. Fucking rage, innit? Uh -huh. but, Kevin Kyle said he used to do that with him as well. Oh, he, 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 he was quite tough on Big Kyle. Because uh -huh. yeah, Big Kev, as you know, he was a big character yeah, in the we'll dressing come room. Him as well, yeah. and he was influential in the dressing room. So that's one thing he was good at. See, the boys that he knew were quite influential in the dressing room. He knew how to, to manage you. And he knew that, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, he gets away with murder him because the manager really likes him. And I think probably a lot of people thought of that about me because he took me two or three clubs. Mm. But he knew that, you know, if he had a go at me, I would get a, he would get a reaction. For the whole dressing room? For the whole dressing room, plus myself as well. So that's what they do. And if he didn't agree yet, we Billy would be standing behind him, just ready to, ready to rock Did and roll. Did he wind him up? Oh, Billy was incredible. <laughs> he would just sit there, Jim, you need to have a word with him. So he'd go bananas. <laughs> and if, if he went bananas at you, you're like, all right, neighbor, and the next thing, Billy would just step out for the shadows and he'd give you both barrels and all, and you're sitting going, fucking hell, have they ever got to stop? But as much as they've done that, see when you won and you played well, they were brilliant. Could they make you feel like the best player in the world? Brilliant, they? Honestly, loved, absolutely loved playing for the two of them. And I think if you look at the success they had in their managerial career, all the boys you speak to, I will say that they love playing for them because they were, they, were they were a great man. Everyone does say it that it comes on. Uh, he gave you the captaincy at age 20. Uh, you remember that conversation? Never forget it. Pulled, pulled his into his office and he's like, usual. He's got a huge presence, the gaffer. Eh? So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Shit, I've done something wrong, eh? Because the minute, minute he says, I want a word with you in the office, you're like, oh no. So I goes in, he's like, what do you think I've got you in here for? And I'm like, oh no, I think last weekend, what was I doing last weekend? Did I, I behave? Did, did, I, did I get any bother or that? And I'm like, yeah, shite, John Aye, basically, yeah. aye. I'm like, <laughs> what's he got? It? I'm like, I don't know, gaffer. So, so I've done something wrong. He's like, have you, like? I says, no, I don't think so. He's like, yeah, I've got to make you the captain in the morning. And like, I'm sitting there going, I'm like magic, but I was, didn't want to show any emotion. I'm like, oh, that'd be brilliant, that'd be a dream come true. Can unbelievable? I says, but can you've got Robbo, Gary Mackay, Dave McCray? He says, no, no, he says, I've got to change everything here. He says, for you know, too long, we've been a club that have been nearly there. He says, now's the time for change. He says, we've had some great players here over the years, but we've never won anything. I'm going to start with making you the captain. So I was like, oh, that's unbelievable, a huge honour. He says, something I've dreamt about all my life. Is it right? Fuck off. <laughs> so I'll see you tomorrow. So I've walked out, drove obviously straight back to my dad's and I'm sitting there, I says, I've got to be captain tomorrow. He's like, you're joking, you fucking captain of captain us. I says, ah, it's unbelievable. So they, obviously my whole family were buzzing for me and then we played Partick out there and it was a surreal feeling, Ed, leading the team out. Was it ner cast. nervous? Oh, I was really nervous. I, I didn't really get nervous. It was one thing. I always like to sort of fart about in the dressing room and have a laugh and joking that before a game you get others that would sit and 
you'd be focused, but I, I always felt the best way to prepare for a game was just to try and be bubbly, yeah. relax, have a laugh and a joke. Uh, but when I was leading the team out, it was probably the first time I'd ever got a bit of butterflies. I'm like, I want my first game as captain to be a win. Uh, and then we beat Partick, so obviously that night we out, had a few beers with two of my great mates, Gary McQuinney, wee Joe Quinn, had been with me for day dot, met them, met out a few beers, brilliant night, and it was a it was a great feeling just to captain Hearts. How was it? How was Robertson and McKay in that? They were great. The captain, they so? were great with me. I must admit. Um, because I thought that was one thing I did think about. I thought, how's the older lads going to react? But I'd like to think that they liked me in the dressing room. You know, I got on well with, I like to think I got on well with everybody. Uh, and, you know, they were great with me. Because uh, they could easily have how the fucking hell are you, Captain, 20 year old? You've not even got that much experience behind you. But they were brilliant, you know. And I wasn't the type that thought, well, that's me, cracked it. If I needed a bit of advice, which I did my whole career, I would always go to, you know, Gary Mackay and Robo. Uh, in the main, they were the two that really looked out for me and kind of asked them for advice, even when I was a captain. Mm. Uh, but one thing was their, their social life certainly improved since <laughs> I got away the skipper because <laughs> I used to love that, kind of organising things, getting us away, places, down to the racing or whatever. Uh, and as a group, I felt you know that was part of your job as captain anyway, was to keep the group close, keep everybody together. Uh, and then on the pitch, try and lead by example, and I think that's what I did. Did the jet announce it in front of everyone, or was it just to you? He told, and that was it. Done? He just told me, and then on the on the Saturday, he named the team, and he went to captain the Dale Bilocky. Um, and a couple of the boys were like, Pfft, very good. <laughs> uh, here's, your, here's your dad gave you the, the captain's <laughs> armband and all. What's he making you for your tea tonight and all that? But he, he did he did look out for his. But I'd like to think that I repaid him in as much that you know he knew I was a decent lad in the dressing room, and he knew that. You know that I wasn't a bad player as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Scottish Cup final, 1996. How exciting was that oh, for a 20-year-old to build was, up to that? I was like buzzing that, and probably looking back and reflecting back on it, that was probably the reason I'd done my knee that day because we had about eight buses for Bonnerig. We all drank in the place. It used to be the Four in Hand, and they changed it to the Chester's Hotel. So we had about eight buses. I must have had to get about 300, 400 tickets for the game. So when they build up to the game, you're like Hart's youngest ever captain in a cup final, you're, you're buzzing and I'm like can think and imagine I'm the, the man that walks up, lifts the cup. Can first time in many years, first time that anybody in my family probably ever seen Hart's winning a trophy, all that. And I probably got too, too worked up for the game. Mm -hmm. And we knew, we knew we were playing against a brilliant Rangers team, you know, they had boys that were unbelievable, Loudrup, Gascoigne, you know, all these boys. I'm, and I'm sitting saying, well, if we play to our potential will beat them because that's how I, I got brought up you know I was, didn't fear anybody didn't fear Rangers or Celtic go out you play your game you'll beat them and then eight minutes into the game Gaza got the ball and he turned and I just went to change direction and I knew because I'd never had a serious injury before and I'm lying there and Alan Ray came on he's like right what is it I says something's went in my knee I says it's the worst pain I've ever had and he's like well you need to get up you need to play on he says, you're the captain, we need you. And I'm like, ah, oh, you right. So I gets up, physio goes back off, and then I, I kind of ran across the pitch, and I'm like, oh, I've done something serious here. And then the ball went over my head, and I went to turn again, and that was it, game over. Um, and I, it was just a mixture of emotions. I'm like, I can't let the team down. I've let everybody down, I'm, okay, I'm no fit. Uh, it's about 10 minutes into the game. Stretcher came on. I, I can remember, like, the Hearts fan gave me a round of applause, and I was just, I was distraught. And I sat in the dressing room and Alan was like, you need to, I said, nah, I want to go and see the game. And you need to let me go out and see the game. So I hobbled out. And then like Rangers that day, Gordon Jury was out of this world. They, they destroyed us. And Big Gilles, you know, he made a mistake for one of the goals. Uh, and after it, I was just distraught. I came back on the bus. There was thousands of Hearts fans at the George Hotel to see us. And I just got a taxi, went back to Bonnerig, sat, sat with my dad and my brothers that night. Had a couple of beers and just... Just went aim, I was I was distraught. Uh night and six you said you got the bad injury uh, in the final, I had to watch your team five one. Would that have been the lowest point of your career? Because then a Aye, long was, injury. That was after the biggest kick in the teeth ever. Plus as well, you know, Scotland we had got to the semi finals of the European Championships and I was you know, heavily involved in that team. I'd played all the games. I was really looking forward to that summer. Because uh, we had the semi, the European Championships, and then Scotland did that. We were playing in the European Championships, so the plan was for my holidays, I was going to go down and watch uh, you know, Scotland doing in, in the Euros. Right. Um, so everything just went tits up. I was like, couldn't they do that? I got my operation, 
And then, you know, I was out. In the days, the, the, the rehab for that injury is completely different now. Kind of, if I'd done it, maybe... Burpees again. Back to burpees. Burpees. <laughs> back, back to touch of the days of that. But the rehab was completely different. So if I'd done it maybe 10 years later in my career, I possibly could have played till I was maybe 39, 40. But because the rehab was, was so poor in the days to what it is now, it ended up, you know, finishing my career at 34. Because you were linked with a few English clubs back then. I was, aye. Have you never got injured, jinked you the left to go to? I don't think, uh, it's not so much I would have wanted to leave. You know, obviously I was hearts through and through, this was my dream. And no matter what had happened to us after I'd made my debut, you know, I could I'd sit and say I've lived the dream. My dream was to play for hearts, simple as that. Um, but, you know, if, at the time the club was not in a great financial situ you know, position. So it was not until, obviously, later on, Coventry City with Gordon Strachan was a manager at the time and they had made a bid for me, which was, a, by all accounts, a, a fantastic bid at the time. But it was before that final. So obviously I didn't think the manager wanted to tell me about it because he didn't want to unsettle me. Right. And it wasn't until after it, you know, he says, look, they've made a, a big bid for you. The club probably would have had to accept it because the the financial situation of the club. So I was fortunate in a way that I'd got my injury because I probably would have, would have left if, if I had to go it. Mm -hmm. um, did you still try to remain like a positive influence, but even though you were injured, Aye. would you still be in about the boys? Without a doubt, I mean, it was hard because all we had here was it was like an old wooden gym with a speedball in it, a dip bar, pull-up bar, and then we had like a leg press in the physio room. So Alan Ray, who, you know, was brilliant with me as a young kid, he became my best mate because I was with him every day. The boys were brilliant with me and the management team were brilliant because sometimes when you're not playing for that length of time, can the manager can forget about you and, all right, they'll say hello to you every now and again, but the manager really made me feel part of everything. And I, obviously I'd go to all the games. Um, that probably didn't help me through my rehab because I'd, I'd just go and be a fan again. Mm -hmm. So I'd go and I'd have a beer before the game and then I'd maybe have a pint after the game if we'd won. And I would be like, you can't, you're not a fan anymore, you're a player. But I'd like, well, look, I didn't like sitting with the, with the boys that aren't playing, because when they score a goal, you know, they, they didn't really celebrate. I like to sit with like my mates. Minute, uh -huh. And then I got into a bit of trouble at yeah, a derby game. Yeah, there was a Hibs fan, he was constantly just shouting at me. And I, I probably sat in a stupid seat. I was right in the wheat field, right beside the Hibs supporters. And he was like, holding his knee and getting all this and everything. So I stupidly then, it didn't normally let stick get to me, but he had been just barracking with the whole 90 minutes and towards the end we scored and I've jumped up. Gave it that, thinking back, <laughs> photos. So I goes in on the Monday and Gaffer's like, you get in, what's this? Front page of the paper, Hearts captain, could have caused a riot, all that stupid lad at the time. Um, and I'm like, listen, I apologise, I, sh I should never have reacted. Um, I, I, I'll come with the team from now on. So that was it. After that, that was, that, it was like, tra you're travelling with the team every game. So my days then, I knew then my days as a sort of fan were done. Were done because I had to, obviously, it's a big, big honour being the captain of Hearts. You can't behave like a, a silly, silly wee boy. And I, that's what I did that day and I paid the price for it. Uh -huh. uh, talking about the team, uh, tips away. I heard a great right. one. Was it Magaluf? Felton oh, in the pool? Okay. Well, at the end of the season, Hearts always paid for us to go. To Magaluf? To Magaluf. So it was, oh, yeah, as long as you did well, so f touch with, you know, every season we had here we, we achieved what we should have achieved. Always got kind of into Europe, but we're always challenging at the top end. So you got rewarded for that. And, and any of the older lads that were married and that, they would get the headed letter, you know, it's, it's no... You can't just like decide whether you want to go or not, it's a club trip, you, you need to come. Oh, so it was brilliant, so the whole squad, um, we went, must have been 10, 15 years running, but after we won the cup, obviously we've went, and we'd been on a bit of a bender after winning the cup and we came here and we were flying from Manchester. So, me being me and Alan McManus being him, we gets to the top of the road there and Alan Ray, it was his, the manager didn't come till like three, four days after we went. So it was Alan Ray's job to get us down to Manchester, make sure we all got on the flight all right and then he was coming back up right. and then he'd fly over with the gaffer three, four days later. We gets to the top of Gorgie Road, says, Alan, it's all right if we stop, just get a, get a wee bite to eat and that. So I may possibly nips into the shop, top of Gorgie Road. Must have spent about four or five hundred quid on this carry -out. Gets it on the bus and Boone, that was his nickname, he went berserk. Who's Boone? Alan, Alan Ray, Ray, the first yeah. He's like, what the fuck do you think he's doing? Like, well, we're going to Manchester, we're going on holidays. Like, you're still representing the club. He gave us this big spiel. <laughs> so the whole carry -out got put 
underneath the bus. No way. We got like two, three I beers. I thought you'd put him under uh, the bus and drink a carrot. We tried. Man. Trust me, we tried. <laughs> two, three beers each. Gets to Manchester. So as soon as he's went, see you, that was it. Absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal trip. Would the jet not get involved in the banter now? He would get involved, oh aye, he would get involved. But he was always, if the boys went out, he was always Separate. away out the road. Because uh -huh. I think, and latterly, when I got into the coaching side, I could understand why. Because when boys got a beer in them, maybe the boys are only playing on maybe so oh, gaffer, how man will play and mm -hmm. it's not the right time to have a discussion like that. So he kinda stepped away from it. But he liked the fact that the boys would all be together and would have a good time together and that because I think that, that made for a good dressing room. But that that trip, because we had we just won the cup, um, it was a brilliant and the stories that I could tell you for that. Even there was one guy, first night we were there, had a heart stop on. Brilliant. So I'm like, how you doing? He's like can't believe it, this is, um, this is a dream come true. I've come to Mallorca and I've met the team. So, stayed with me all week, stayed in, I was, I think it was, who was our roommate? I think it was Big, big Davy Weir, our roommate, slept with us all week. Last night, the, the boy did? The boy did. Oh, slept with us room? all week, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Second last night, I think it was, this woman come up to me and was like, you, you're a fucking this and that. And I'm like, it's your problem. Like, see him? That's my husband. <laughs> he passed her the whole week. He passed her for the week. Spent the whole week with me and the team. And he was on holiday with his wife. Brilliant. That's brilliant, eh? It was brilliant. Listen, we scored the Easter Road the season after it. We're all celebrating and I seen him. He's standing in the front gate and all this. I was like, that's legendary, man. He's come to Magaluf with his wife and spent the whole week with the honest, team. Did you get off him? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I was too drunk. Who else in that squad did have been a good laugh in? Full and oh, Davey Muir? My nah. course was brilliant. Like, he, he, he's probably ended up one of my best mates in the game. Stevie but Fulton, huh? Stevie Fulton and, and Horse Horse was Who's horse, you know, Stevie like Weir? Right, okay. Brilliant. I'm not like, even going to ask why every, he gets called every, Horse, every, I can't imagine. A few, I think there's a few reasons as to why he got called that. I think right. it's the way, the way he ran. He had a horse's trot. Uh, but I'd go through to Falkirk with all Big Davies mates and uh, his mate Tommy, who's a great lad, Tommy and Juicy had like a pub and a nightclub. so. When we went out as a team, it was difficult sometimes to go out as a team in Edinburgh because obviously your yeah, Hearts fans would recognise you, your Hibs fans would, would recognise you. So Tommy had the Clacken pub in Shield Hill and honestly we used to go through and he'd have it all ready for us arriving. You know, there'd be like every colour of drink you could imagine on the bar. So if we had one, we're through there. Really, really looked after us. Uh, and then we'd go to Hughes's nightclub, it was called like FK1 or something in Falkirk. So we were in there. And they two were brilliant for us. They were like our social conveners because we knew we would get peace and quiet for them. But at the same time, they knew how like say some of the boys would behave. So they'd be all right they with would it. Be, be all right with it and that. Because everyone thinks Davy Weir's this big quiet guy. Aye, eh? no, I mean it, it's probably he's got the four kids in that now, so he's settled right down. But I used to mean mean big Davy used to go out like pretty much all the time, like my mates. To see McQuinney and we joke and, and Horse had his mates like Tommy and Yuzi and that. So we'd all go out together, we'd go on holiday together. And even to this day, we still meet up at the end of the season and, and go for a few beers, which right. you know, was fantastic. Uh, right, you've talked about the Scottish Cup final. Was there any chance of you getting fine, fit, fit for it? The gaffer gave me every chance. Um, so the boys went down to England and uh, they were obviously doing their preparing. And he says to me, look, if you're fit, you'll play. So he left me up here, I was getting treatment basically 24-7. Um, and then on the Thursday, the boys came back up the road and he says, right, I'll get you a fitness test Thursday. If you pass it, you're playing. On the Wednesday night, I knew. I, I knew, I'd ran on the Wednesday and my knee was struggling. And I could have you know, said, I'm all right. Played for five minutes, came off and I'm like, no, nah, you've got to put the team first. I was always like that. Even though I was a captain, the team comes first. So on the Thursday, I went and I says, listen, there's no, there's no point in me even trying, my knee's killing me, it's still all swollen. Um, all I want is the team to win the cup. I said, I couldn't care less about myself. It's, it was difficult because I'd missed the League Cup final with my knee, I was missing this cup final with my knee. Um, and I, and I'd, obviously I'd came back and I'd played all the early rounds in this competition, so I'd played my part and I'm like, I'm no fit. So I got my head around that, but at night, I'm not going to lie to you, I went home the Thursday night, you know, and I sat in my house myself and kind of was dead emotional. I was sort of kind of like, Ken, it's happened to me again, I'm going to miss another final. Ken, when am I ever going to get a, a wee break here? But I thought, next again day, you're still the captain, the boys were all like, you know, you're club captain, we, we need you here. And I'd done my usual, I just went about it like I was playing, you know, I was encouraging everybody, I was in the dressing room before the game. 
uh, try to lift everybody's spirits and that, and then obviously the boys went and, went and done the business. And for me, first and foremost, as a fan, I'd seen Hearts lift their cup, and it was probably the, the best day best day ever. Was it nerve-wracking watching it for the oh, Horrific. The last 10 minutes, and any Hearts fan will tell you the same, the last 10 minutes felt like five hours. And, you know, well, it, obviously, I think it was Coisties went down with a big Davies tackle on the edge of the box, and you're thinking, oh no, well, he's got to get a penalty here. We've got to blow it again. He hit, gave a free kick outside the box, and luckily for us that day, Alberts was suspended, because they got about 10, 11 free kicks for about 30 yards out that Alberts was deadly. You know, he would score, whereas Amaruso was was booting the ball into fucking Row Z, he was booting it into like fucking Bishop down and all that, you know, yeah. it was like, thank God he was hitting the free kicks. And then obviously when, when he blew the final whistle, it went for like the best feeling ever. Then I was in the tunnel area and all the boys, Marcel, Katongo, Point and McManus, all the boys that were in the squad that hadn't played that day, this guy, I'll never forget his face, it was the SFA and he's like, you can't get on the pitch. And I, I'm like, aye, aye, very good mate, get out of the road. He's like, you're not getting on the pitch, because if, if we let you out on the pitch, you just could incite a riot. Beat and it. I'm sitting going, mate, I've waited my whole life for this. You get out my road. So I kind of grabbed him, just as I grabbed him, the gaffers came in to do a television interview. And he's like, what's the problem? I says, okay, I'm not going to repeat what I said, but I says, this joker's not letting us on the pitch. I says, all we want to do is get out on the pitch and see the boys. And Jim and the gaffer and Chris Robinson, to be fair, came in and went, if they didn't go on the pitch, there'll not be a presentation of the trophy. You let them on the park. They're kind of every bit as much part of this squad as the boys that have played today. So we get on the park and it was unbelievable. Like I'll never forget it. The fans were all gone mental. Could you see your dad in there? My twin brother was on the pitch before me. He had the <laughs> white hair strip, maroon shorts. Can not it be you? I, what he had done is when the final whistle went, because he had the strip that we were wearing, he's dived on the park. So he's grabbed big... Big Davy, Paul Ritchie, because it was obviously he knew them all because we socialised and all that. He's jumping about with him, and then eventually, I think one of the boys went, Right, Kev, you better get back in the terrace or you're going to get lifted here. So he's jumped back into the heart end. I've went out. First, I've just seen all the boys, I was just just so happy. And then I've seen like all my mates, my dad, my, all my family were in the, the heart end, and like they're all in tears. We were, we were all in tears because we were just so, it was just so emotional in that. And it's a day, as I say, it's a day that. I was, in, I was lucky because I've won two trophies here in my time here. And 2012 was unbelievable, but that one was like magic because loads of generations of Hearts fans never ever thought they'd see us winning anything, myself included. And I thought back to like Dens Park, how I felt well, that day. So, that, so see at that time, you right. actually thought back to oh, eight right, times? Right. As soon as the final whistle went, I went like ah, Remember how I was feeling at Dens? And I seen like my dad and my uncles and all my mates and all the boys that were on the bus, they're all like grown men in tears. And I'm like, I'll never forget how bad I felt that day, because it was the lowest day I've ever had. And then to see everybody, the same people, so crying happy. again, but it was sort of obviously tears of joy. It was like, it was so surreal, it was incredible. And then, because you played in previous rounds, you and Stevie Foote and lift the cup, ah, would that be the most special moment of your career? It was unbelievable. It, and I wasn't expecting it, but he must look pitch, great next to Stevie Fulton as well. Oh, that was looking brilliant. <laughs> when I, the suit was horrific, and the, I get hammered for the hairstyle. But if it was good enough for Beckham, it was good enough for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and you know the says is you're lifting the cup. You're our captain. You're the club captain. You're the one that's led us all season. We want you to lift the cup. And to be fair, Tam Cowan hammers me because like you you done it before John Terry done it. <laughs> you still, but it, it, I didn't want it to be like that because Fulters was the captain that day and Fulters had been brilliant that season. And he'd say, look, you're lifting the cup. I was the captain on the day, but you're lifting the cup. I want you to lift the cup because you're my captain typing. And you know, I'll never forget that to this day. That, that was how much it meant to me. But the boys were brilliant yeah, because at the end of the day, they were the boys that won the cup. You know, I, I obviously I was played in the early rounds and that and I was part of the squad. But I genuinely didn't believe I deserved a medal that day because I didn't play. But to lift the cup and see so many happy faces, and obviously for the gaffer and Billy as well, because we'd been beat in the previous two finals, and big Jules as well. You know, I had, a wee, I had a wee five minutes with Jules after that final because I'd had a nightmare in 96, and big Jules had a bad day that day as well. This was complete reverse because he was outstanding that day. He was man of the match. And just to see him... And he was, a, he was a lovely big lad, unbelievable uh, teammate. And to see him so happy for what he had achieved that day was, was something that 
kind of even talking about it now, it still makes me like well up a uh -huh. wee bit because the big man was honestly the nicest guy in the world and he deserved that final so much because of what he had went through in 96. The celebrations after it, where was it back to here? It's incredible. The problem we had that day was, obviously we're, we're in the dress room, straight on the, the beer, champagne everywhere. None of us had obviously had there and eat since the pre-match meal. Then Fulte and Big Jules got picked to go and do a drug test. So whilst they're doing that, we're obviously in the dress room, we're on the drink, gets on the team bus, and we must have sat in the team bus for two hours. Waiting on, on them. waiting on Fulte day in the toilet. So by the time he came on the bus, <laughs> we're all Steven. miraculous. <laughs> like my rat. And it's probably my biggest regret because when we came back here, I'd, we, we kind of, we didn't know what to expect. And I think a lot of Hearts fans were saying, like, what, what do you do now? We're that used to going to finals and getting beat. We go and get a few beers and go home. Like, what do we do now? So we got to like Sight Hill and then the fire brigade, there's a fire station just as you come into Sight Hill. All these Hearts fans are on top of the the the, the uh, fire engines. Fire engines, eh? And they've got the heart scarfs and that, and they're all jumping about. So we're like, fucking, hell, what's happening here? And the closer we we got to like Chesser, the more people were kind of coming onto the streets and that. And then we got to Chesser, and um, to this day I'm amazed that neighbor that nobody got injured or, or no, nobody ended up under the bus because you had fans jumping out for everywhere. I think you can see some of the footage on like Neil Point, and he did a homemade video at the time. And there was punters just jumping out for pubs, they were jumping out for the street, they were jumping in front of the bus. And it took, must have took us about two hours just to get along Gorgie Road. And by the time we got just round this bend here, it was carnage. Kind of was, there was, the, the driver couldn't see because of the champagne on the windows <laughs> of the bus. Like, all the boys were on the roof of the bus, how none of them fell off, I'll never know. And then when we got here, Hazel Irvin was trying to interview us and it's the most embarrassing interview I've ever done. I couldn't <laughs> chew my fingernails. <laughs> I'm like that, effing and blinding and all that. And then Fulters is like, oh, I just read a book on the way back and all that. <laughs> we're off Polacks. Uh -huh. And then we got into the Gorgie suite. Miraculous, all night, brilliant. Ended up in Robbo's pub. And then I woke up. John Robertson got a pub close to you? He had Robertson's bar, it's shut now. Right. He had a pub, we ended up in there and then I ended up. Uh, I woke up on the carpet of his house, <laughs> as I normally did. I can't remember uh, Suit still on, and I'm like, shit, I have to be at Tin Castle for like half ten. So I had to get a taxi back to Bonner. I got my tracksuit back in here, still melted. Gets on the bus here, and then we had a reception at the city chambers and all that. And then the Sunday was even better. What was the Sunday? We had the parade the through bus. Edinburgh. So you're talking. Without any exaggeration here, 250,000 Hearts fans from the city chambers all the way along Princess Street, all the way to here. Then we went out on the pitch and never seen anything like it. And to be fair to the gaffer, he had said to us, if you win a trophy here, lads, you will not believe the response you'll get from the fans. And uh, it was... What did was the mad. foreign boy, they, could they not believe it? They couldn't believe it. I was like, I remember phoning my mate as well on the Sunday morning. I was like, how are you? And he's like, I slept on the pitch. So McQuinney and my mate wee Fergie, they broke in with a carry out, slept on the 18-yard box. No way. And now I've come in on the Sunday, they're, they're still here. It. And I'm like, that's legendary, that. That's says, I never even thought of that. I went back to Robbo's and said, oh, I would have probably joined you. So <laughs> it was just unbelievable. See the things that people did? Uh -huh. And that, I genuinely believe, like, Hearts should bring out a book with the fans and their stories eh, after that final about what they did and how they got here and where they came from and all that. Because some of the stories I've heard over the years are incredible. What would uh, Jet and, uh, and Billy have done? Well, they, he stayed in one of the hotels up the tune. Because he tells a story, I know that the gaffer in the morning, he went, he, he was rough as anything, so he's went to try and get some paracetamol. He says, he's walked along Princess Street, he says, this heart's fan. He says, you see, he'd obviously slept there. Eh? He just looked up at him and went, see that Jim Jeffries is a god. And went back to sleep. <laughs> and he says, I got by him and then the boys kind of woke up and went, and that's him, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was just, it was, incre it was an incredible couple of days. Uh -huh, Would that have been the best weekend of your career? Aye, aye, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and then Magaluf on the Monday, was it? Magaluf on the Tuesday, Tuesday. so basically I went out the Saturday, we were out Sunday, as you do, joined the Monday club in Bonnerig, and then the Tuesday I knew we, was, we were going to Magaluf anyway. And, and to be fair, I suffered for it when I came back, and some of the dreams I had in that when I came back. <laughs> <laughs> Horrendous, but it was, uh, it was a, a couple of days that I dreamt about all my life, you know, as I said to you, although I was captain of the club at the time, I was a fan. And it was the first time I'd ever seen Hearts winning anything, so you just went, you went What a week. Uh, talking about big games, Edinburgh Derby. Yeah, what, what's games. the one that stands out for you? What's your favourite? Probably the first one I played in. I, I played a, 
I played what fourteen derbies, thirteen or fourteen derbies, and I was lucky that I didn't lose any. So that was that was a thing that now that I'm retired, I can look back at that with immense pride. But uh, I'd played one where I set up the goal and got brought down for the penalty. But the, my first derby was probably the most memorable because. I had a nightmare, eh? I was trying to kick everything apart from the ball <laughs> and uh, I didn't play well at all but I got the ball with about 20 minutes to go and I've played a, a decent ball into the box and Alan Johnston had brought it down and wrapped it in and probably three months before that I used to stand in the shed all the time so it was like the corner at Hearts where all the, all the, <clears throat> the donuts cases, of the yeah. day used to stand <laughs> so we've ran over to that and then as I say I see wee joke, I see McQuinney, I see yeah, my dad, they're yeah. on the fence so I've jumped on the fence and I'm like yeah get in there so I'm standing and I'm like, five minutes later, I'm like, you better let me go because I better get back to the halfway line because we're about to start the game. But just running over there and seeing all the boys that I obviously stood with every week, they're on the fence as I'm running towards them on the pitch. And it was a brilliant... Surreal, and, huh? the, like The place was gone berserk and we won the game 1-0. Uh, so that was my favourite derby simply because I know the old shed was still there so it was all, all the maniacs gone daft and you're running over having set up the goal as well. Uh, and to beat them 1-0, it was, it was brilliant. Were there any games you'd always look forward to in the season? I, I mean, I looked forward to every game because I've seen it as a massive honour every game I played. To play? To play with Hearts. Um, it was a massive thing for me, but the derbies were obviously special. And kind of, the 90 minutes, it's pure, like, we need to beat them and it's hatred and you say things on the pitch that you would never dream of saying. But over the years, you know, I've got to meet, like, say, Mickey Weir, Paul Kane, Keith Wright. Like myself, they were massive hibs, Men, Marcel, Crabble, Gary Mackay, we were massive jambos. And the great lads, you know, they, they were doing the same as me. They were living the dream with Hibs. Mm -hmm. And I was living the dream with Hearts. And, you know, it was enormous respect there. And probably more so now that I'm finished my career. Because obviously during the 90 minutes, it's like, you know, I talk to them, I didn't like them, blah, blah, blah. But they were just doing the same as what we were doing. And, and over the years, you know, I've got to meet a lot of, you know, Hibs supporters, Hibs, ex-Hibs players and that, who are, you know, great, great people. And, all right, there is a lot that didn't like you, but they didn't know you. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's important, you know, you see the rivalry with some, some clubs and it's, they take it to an extreme. There's a big rivalry, rivalry with us in name, but there's huge respect for, for each other as well. But you still enjoyed kicking shit at Aye, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, you said you are living a dream. The dream comes to an end. When Jim Jeffries went to Bradford, did you know that he'd, he'd try and take you? No, really, I was here, obviously Craig was the manager here and I knew he was going to make changes uh, and I knew I wasn't going to be part of the plan. Why did he pull you in and tell you? Huh? Never really told me as much, but my contract was coming to an end and you know I'd been here just just short of 10 years. Uh, and I was disappointed because obviously 10 years you get a testimony and all that type of stuff, so I was just short of that, but to get the opportunity to play in the English Premiership uh, was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. And, and Bradford was struggling at the time. Uh, they were well adrift near the bottom, but... When, when the gaffer went down there, he phoned me and said, would you be keen to come? And I had a, a couple of other clubs that were, were interested in me at the time in England, but I thought, you know, it's time for change. I, I'm getting a bit stale here. I'd had a couple of injury problems. I wasn't playing, you know, I was always a central midfielder. That's what a lot of people, they'll say, he's a right back, he's a right back. I played right back because our midfield was that strong. Cameron and Fulton. Cameron and Fulton and Salvatore. Um, and when Salvatore wasn't fit, I played in there and I loved it, but I knew that didn't matter how well I played in the middle of the pitch, I was always going to get shifted shift. back to right back. <laughs> um, so I was a wee bit disappointed, but when I went to Bradford, I played there. You know, I played centre mid. I went to Kelly, I played centre mid. And probably at Bradford was as good, good a spell as I had f uh, for the initial sort of two or three seasons. Uh, and I, I loved it, and it was brilliant. Did you think you should have played centre midfield more here? Aye. Aye, because that was my position. Would you yeah. say that to the manager? Oh, aye, I'd say, I'd say that to him once my career was finished. I'd, <laughs> I'd maybe say that to him on the odd occasion where I'd be in discussing the bonuses and that. But I knew as well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't stupid. Like, the three midfielders that we had were, were different class. And I knew that I would play there if, if Salvatore wasn't playing. Mm -hmm. But the balance that we had in there with the three midfielders was, was exceptional. So I knew... I wasn't the type to say, right, you know what, I'm going to take the hump here and moan that I'm not playing centre midfield and end up on the bench. I was happy to play because it was such a good team. Yeah. So if it meant playing right back, you know, I had to play there. And what was it like leaving here? Obviously, your boy ah, who was, Do you remember the day you actually ah, left? Ah, I was gutted. Um, and probably, as stupid as it sounds, you didn't realise how big a club hearts are until you leave. You know, I've obviously I've been brought up, died in the wool jambo, followed the club all my life. But you didn't really look at the club in terms of the size, because you're such a big fan. 
But when you go and play with other clubs or you see other clubs, you then realise just how big a club Hearts, it, Hearts is. Uh, and then I went to Bradford, a great, great time there. Um, you know, played the Premiership, playing against like Liverpool, Newcastle, Man United and that. You're like, dream come true, this. And then, although we went to the Championship, there was loads of great teams in the Championship as well, which are brilliant. Great league, league. Yeah. And I loved it. And I probably should have done it two, three years earlier because it did, it gave me a new lease of life. You're playing against different players, you're not playing against the same team all the time. And the banter was brilliant down there, being a Scotsman, like the wee kit man, Jacko. First day I'm in, he's like, morning jock. You know, I mean, it's like, morning jock, how are you? And we took, me and him used to hammer each other, like, that's right, English football, it's shite and all that, and he'd <laughs> Scottish game's garbage. And I'm like, okay. so the banter was brilliant then. So one day, I thought I'd get the better of him most of the time. I goes in and he's like, right, jock, he says, Come and explain this to me. And because we split into two sixes, right, you've got Motherwell sitting in sixth place with like 35 yeah. points. And then I think it was like, maybe Kilmarnock were below them. They've got like Their 45 points. points. He says, right, explain that to me. I says, no, what, Jacko, you've done me. <laughs> so that right. was me. So they move shut, never say the word after yeah. that, but it was a brilliant, brilliant club. Is it Donning going into a new dressing room, though, when you've been so comfortable, you've only been one dressing room for so many years, and you're ah, going into a it new was, dressing room? It was Donning in as much, you know what? It's like you go to a new club, I was quite bubbly in the dressing room, I loved a laugh and a joke and that. And uh, you go to a new club, you're like, the first week, just get in, keep the head down. I would no upset anyone in that. So that's what I did. And you're going into a dressing room with boys like Lee Sharp, Benny Carbone, Stan Collimore, wow. Robbie Blake, uh, big, big names, Gary Walsh, you go, he'd been at Man United. And uh, you know, I went in there thinking, big, big names here, Peter Beagrey and that. Then I trained with him for a couple of days. Uh -huh. You trained with him for a couple of days and then you think, all right, they're, they're good players, but they're kind of, I've played against every bit as good players up in up in Scotland, you know, with Gaza and Loudrop, who are better than some of these lads. Mm -hmm. um, I went in there and, and felt quite at home pretty much straight away, but the boys were great. You know, they really made you feel at home. And we had a big goalie there, Aidan Davidson, who was, I mean, I'd met some maniacs in my time. Yeah, what he he, what he was did? crazy. Just, just mad. I mean, we signed a lad, Klaus Jorgensen, and like what I'm saying to you, you go to a new club, you know yourself, you kind of just get you the feelers out the first couple of days. We went to Cataract for an army camp, right? And uh, we're standing there and Klaus had just signed the day before. So that night he'd accused Andy Myers, Jamie Lawrence and that, he'd taken his toiletries and all that. And we're, can you're sitting there going, who's this boy? <laughs> so, Shyness. So about three o'clock in the morning, right? There was like a big dormitory with all the team in it. And then you had like a wee room off the, off the side of it, so there's about six or seven years in this wee room and all the other boys are in the big dorm. So I just gets this slap on the head and I'm like, it's that? And I'm no joking, I just about shit myself, eh? <laughs> this twat's got the tights. Okay, now you're robbing a bag. <laughs> Over his head, right? He's like, shut up, get up. So he's got six pairs of these tights, right? So we've all stuck to the one. He's like, that close, I'm not having that. You can't come to a new club and, and be as chirpy as that, right? <laughs> So little known to us, we're in Cataract, the army camp, he had got a he asked the sergeant, who's a Scots lad, brilliant, for the, you know, the bombs that they use when they're practising and that, so you basically throw the bomb, it makes Big the noise, biggest eh? noise in the world, and you know, the smoke comes out, so he's got two of them, so this is like three in the morning, he's launched this into the dorm, right? We were running with the tights, grabbed Klaus, he's like, hey, he's getting it. He grabbed him, but I know, they watched him Klaus's face, I've never seen a rest oh, of my life. It. And Eddie's like, ah, that'll teach him. You didn't come to a new club and be as chirpy as that. And we were sitting there. I was double, Amazing. double. Amazing. Bananas he was, but what a laugh. And it was a, a, again, it was another good dressing room. But some of the things he did in that army camp, you're like, you had to see it. Lee Sharp must have a few stories, eh? Oh, he had millions, millions. He was, I mean, even when we went to Catterick and that, can the, all the females that were in the army, they were all like, can get was your awful. autograph and all that. And what a career he had had. So for me, you know, to play alongside boys like, boys like him and, and Benny, you know, it was, it was fantastic and it brought it brings you on as a player because the, the better players you're playing with, the better you become and, uh, you know, it was brilliant playing with uh, Just on the Premier League, who, who was the best you played against, up against the midfield? Uh, we played Newcastle, obviously that's that's my English team, I, I, I like, you know, watching the Geordies and you know, I pray they win something one day but their midfield that day was like Batty, Gary Speed, you know, Top Shearer players. up front. Brilliant, we went 2-0 up against them and then you know, Shearer got one, just turned and hit it for anywhere, top bin. Then we drew two each, but just playing against these boys was brilliant because you had to be quicker. 
I felt down there you, you, you did get a wee bit more time on the ball, but if you made a bad pass or you made a wrong decision, you got punished. Punish, and yeah, yeah. they would they would score. Uh, but they had they had a great team at, at that time. Uh, was that the so, year they got Champions League with Bobby Robson, was it? Um I think, I think they, were, they were up the top, yeah. up the top, and then Leeds, Leeds had Ferdinand, Boyer, Harry Duca, Harry Kuehl, um, so that, that, I mean, they, they were exceptional as well. Uh, so to play against these boys was was brilliant. Was it just too much for too much work to do for Brad? Aye, we, we were, as I say, by the time I had signed there, we were we were adrift, um, and then we ended up going down to the Championship. But just just that sort of six seven months of playing against these teams, and can you're going to Anfield, you've got your Goodison, Twight Hart Lane. It was, it was it was unbelievable. Oh, you know. uh, why did Jim leave? I can think they hit we hit financial problems at Bradford. You know, um, they kind of followed me about in my career. To be fair, <laughs> your wages, a bit of a jinx, aye. <laughs> so, uh, we had administration that spent money that, that they shouldn't have been spending. The uh, boy Jeffrey Richmond there was a let's say a, a rather flamboyant character, and you know he was spending. Much. I mean, we had players at Bradford that were probably on more. Than what, like, say, Gary Neville and schools and that were getting at Man United. Really? Which, at that time, is ridiculous when you see what they achieved. Um, but we, we just spent crazy money and then obviously it took its toll. Club went into administration and then we had a season in the Championship. We started brilliant. We were up the top, had a great side, and then obviously Berry had to leave, Windass left, Petrescu and all that moved on. So it was like we then became obviously a, a lot weaker. And we finished what mid table that season, which was which was all right. I thoroughly enjoyed my time down there. See when Jeffrey's left, with that were you kinda of thinking, I want to get away here? No, no, I I genuinely seen my future in England. Um because the, the gaffer left, um, then he came back up the road. But obviously I I was really enjoying my football at Bradford. I loved it. I loved playing at different places, playing against different players. And I was probably playing as well as what what I'd played for you know, a number Your of years. Uh, uh, no, did, did pretty well I thought down there and then we went and uh, we got to the summer and basically the PFA down there were brilliant uh, we got a phone call saying that you've all been sacked everybody's sacked that's you and you're sitting can I just arrived on my holidays and I'm like can hell no going to get any wages or that and then Mick Maguire for the PFA's phone days about five minutes later just report back first day pre-season everything will be fine they can't sack you blah 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 so they were brilliant but we went through that summer, we, we didn't really get, you know, our wages that we were supposed to get. The PFA gave us some money just to, to make up for no getting paid. paid uh -huh. So it went on for like five, six months. And then when the gaffer phoned me to come back up the road, I'll be honest with you, it, it wasn't my first choice. But at the time, it was, it was close season. And you know what it's like, clubs didn't really go and sign loads of players close season because they're not really what to pay you for doing nothing, nothing during uh -huh. the close season. And I just felt it was a bit of stability, you know, I was, uh, I was at a stage where I, I wasn't getting paid for like six, seven months. I'm like, I need to get something sorted. And then, you know, they're purely working with him and Billy again, obviously, and, and Kilmarnock. When I went up to meet the directors there, you know, Bill Costley and that, they were, they were fantastic. And I, I got a really good feeling when I went up there, you know, it was... Obviously, I played against Kilmarnock, but they had just built a new hotel. They had aspirations to build a training ground. The, the pitch was... You know, fantastic at the time, great stadium, great fan base. I thought, you know what, uh, it was a three-year contract, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go back up the road and, and play up there again. And you enjoy your time, man? Loved it, loved it, great club. You know, I wouldn't say a bad word about uh, anybody at Kelly. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. It was difficult, didn't get me wrong, when I became sort of assistant manager there and, and manager. There was a, one or two things that you can't really influence there, uh, which I felt I might have been able to, but I couldn't. Uh, but you know, I was I was gutted at the way it, it finished as as the manager there. But in terms of my playing career there, loved every minute. See, when you were at Kilmarnock playing, was it always kind of in the back of your mind that you wanted to go into coaching? Is that when you started? I think to when I got to sort of 32, 33, I was starting to have a few problems with the knee, which had obviously caused me problems throughout my career. Um, and the manager had said, "You need to start thinking." And I, my, even me myself, I was like, "I need to start thinking about life after football." And because of, you know, I've done football, like most boys will say to you, they've done it all their life, you'll be the same, you know, you played it at school, you went right into it for school. Uh, and, you know, I had standard grades at school, but I wasn't Einstein by any manner, I mean, so... Um, I looked at it and I thought, right, I need, to, I need to focus on something. So I started to do my coaching badges with the SFA, and, you know, brilliant. I was glad I did it when I did, because I was still playing, 
but I was doing my coaching badges at the same time. So I'd done the B license at Murray Park with, and it was just like players, players only, which was great. Done that, done the A license. And then towards the end of my career, four surgeons kind of says to me, listen, your knees goose bone on bone. Keep playing, you're going to end up in a wheelchair. If you, if you stop playing now, you've got a chance of a better life when you stop. So when they say that to you, decision's made. Sad day when you retire, sir. A horrible day. Horrible day. Did you, Every bit as horrible as that day at Dens Park, because obviously you're, I was watching games and think I can still play here, but obviously the knee was not. What games was that, under-13 games? No, under-13, <laughs> under-11. <laughs> uh, so you're watching games thinking, you know, I could still do a job for the boys, but at the same time, I'd play a game, I'd get the fluid taken out my knee on the Monday morning, I couldn't walk on the Sunday, I was taking, honestly, these tablets called Zydols, if you, if you get on them, oh... They're the business. <laughs> Couldn't you feel my face in the warm up? <laughs> Couldn't you feel my days? I'd genuinely go and play the game. Everything was great. Then a Sunday morning, my God, see when the tablets had wore off, I, I genuinely couldn't walk. Really, right? And it got to the stage where I genuinely wasn't enjoying it anymore. It was, it was just horrible waking up every Sunday morning in constant pain. Couldn't get down the stairs. I'm like, no, what? That's it. It's time to, it's time to wrap it. And then we got into the coaching side for about five minutes, <laughs> and then. I got told, ah, you're joining the backroom staff at Kelly. There's a contract there for you. You're going to become first team coach. So I went over to Italy with them pre season, came back, no deal. Because so of money? Was, well, that was the excuse I got. I mean, there was a lot of things happened that I, I wouldn't really want to go into, but I was I was disappointed with the way things worked out there. For Just for. Um, it was Michael Johnson, he was the chairman at the time. He'd, made a couple of promises that, that weren't fulfilled and you know after that as I say I, I wouldn't say a bad word about anybody that come out because it was a fantastic club but there was always a problem there with the fans especially because it was like they didn't have any trust in Mike obviously I can just speak from my own personal experience you know when somebody says something to you especially in football you take them to their word, word and that obviously never got fulfilled they say they didn't have the money so I'm like well that's football you know what I mean there isn't a point crying about it there's a, the next chapter of my life I need to move on and then your old dad phoned you to take the for the first team I was, job at I was I was to hear from him I was, well I spoke to him anyway because obviously he's somebody him and Billy I've always kept in touch with him uh, and that can kind of say that squad well, well I do keep in touch but when I'd seen that he was getting the job here obviously I was delighted but I'm like okay, what's he letting me sell in for here because uh -huh. I was watching Hearts at the time and uh, came in, we were going through managers every three four weeks and uh, he went back and he phoned me and says right We've got to bring you back to Hearts, first team coach. Like, brilliant, unbelievable. Going back home, came in and uh, he said, met him for something to eat actually and he says, you do realise this is a different club for the club that you've left. And obviously I was well aware of everything that was going on and obviously there's a lot of things that you hear behind the scenes and that. I said, I don't know, I'm just buzzing to be getting back in. It's an opportunity to get back into coaching. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And he says, right, you're meeting Vladimir tomorrow. I says, all right. I says, right, what am I getting? What wages am I getting? He's like, I've not got a clue. <laughs> I says, well, what will I ask for? He's like, I've not got a clue. <laughs> so I goes in and it was like five of them are sitting there and they just stared at me like that big Dolph Lundgren kind of Rocky uh, in the Rocky movie, like uh, how he stared at Rocky. Uh, <laughs> they're just staring at me and I could have said... Did they have the tights on? They never had the tights on. Tights on. <laughs> I was delighted about that. But they're just sitting there. And it was like, I could have told them the funniest joke in the world. I uh, don't think any of their faces would have moved. And they're just staring, so I, like, I sit like this, and they're like, oh, there. And I'm thinking, right, it's, I, I'm thinking to myself, I'm probably going to... You're shitting yourself a bit? Aye, uh -huh. aye, and I'm, like, I'm quite game in that, eh? but I was like, that day I was genuinely shitting myself. Yeah. I'm like, are they going to ask me something here, or are they expecting me to speak? Because I thought, okay, I'm going in here for a bit of an interview. And he just sort of stared at me for a bit. It felt like an hour. And he went, what do you want? And I'm like... Initially, I thought, he, can't, he, he seemingly can't speak English. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you want? And I'm like, eh, well, what do you mean? Money? What do you want? And I'm like, well, I thought you were going to tell me that. And he went, eh, okay. And then there was another silence, and he went, like, go. So I've walked out, and the gaffer's sitting, he's like, how did you get on? And I went, I, I didn't honestly know. <laughs> I said, I don't even know if I've got a deal. So a couple of days later, he's like, right, you're in, this is what you're getting. I was like, all right, neighbor. How much was it? Oh, I'm shit. Horrific. <laughs> Horrific. I think uh, my wee nephew gets me a did a paper room. And, uh, so I was like, you know what, I'm just buzzing. I, I'd never had a job, so whatever I was getting, it was going to be more than what I was earning. 
I knew I had to get back into work. Uh, and obviously, you're, you, you've been there yourself, you're sitting going, what do I do? I, I've not really got that many qualifications. All I know is football. They're going to be a taxi driver. They're going to be trying to get a job somewhere else. Uh, so the fact I knew I was coming back into football, I was like, absolutely over the moon, coming back to Hearts. Uh, but it was, it was completely different to, to when I was here as a player. So what was your role then? Did you take training? I helped with the training. I, I took the training with, with Billy. And put the uh, markers out. Put the markers out, aye. Yeah. But th th that was a great thing because I didn't want to just come back and, you know, as you say, put cones out and sit and watch. Kinda, if I was coming in, I wanted to Do you know, take part. So, you know, I got to take sessions, I, I got involved. And the great thing, it's probably the role that suited me the best because I, I was kind of the link between the management team and the players. So I still got to have that bit of banter bad. with the players, but at the same time, I had a, you know, as anybody that knows me, I'll, I'll tell you, I've got a serious side to me when it comes to coaching and, and managing, you know, I, I've, I obviously like to think I've set high standards. So I had that side, but I also loved the, the bit of banter with the boys in the dressing room. And it was, it was a great bunch of sort of younger lads that we inherited. I mean, they, talk, I, they, do, they do talk greatly about you uh, when they speak when on When I here. came back, honestly, we had 75 players or something. So the gaffer and Billy would go home at about two o'clock. But we still had another squad of 30 players that needed, coaching. needed coaching. So I would take them. And you know what it's like, they're coming in at three in the afternoon, no more to be there. But I just tried, tried my best to lift the spirits. I tried the best to put on good training sessions for them. Uh, and then eventually we did manage to get the, the size of the squad done because it was, it was becoming a problem. There was boys, they couldn't get changed in the dressing room because we didn't have enough room. Uh, I mean, there was boys there that, no, not being horrible, but they weren't good enough good to enough, play yeah. with Hearts and we had to try and move them on. And, and fortunately, over the course of that season, the gaffer done that. Is there any coaching badge in the world that can prepare you for a player like Kevin Kyle? No, nah, not one. Not one. For a, a, there's, the, didn't get me wrong, I've done the pro licence with, with Jim Fleeting in the SFA and I would recommend it to anyone. It's one of the best things that I did. The calibre of people that you watch, the, the, the stuff you learn on it is unbelievable. Um, but it, there is certain things in it that you're never going to learn. Came with, with boys with, with problems away from football, uh, which again I'm not going to go into too much detail. But you know, as a manager, you know, I, I was never a gambler. I, I, I didn't. Really, I put a bet on with Big Davy fixed odds years ago. That was it. I wasn't even that bothered about horse racing unless we had a wee team day out there. But you had boys coming in like gambling debts, they had problems with their mental state and all that. Now, I'm not qualified to deal with that, but you deal with it as best you can. Uh, and it doesn't matter what course you go on. With Big Kev, you know, he had everything. <laughs> he was a great lad. He, he, liked, his, he liked betting. He, uh, you know, he, he was influential in the dressing room. He would talk shite at times, but... <laughs> <laughs> and then he would talk a lot of sense at times. Uh -huh. So it was how you managed oh, I've him. Heard, I've heard it was how you that, managed uh, him. And he was, I'll tell you what, he was a big, big player for us. We loved it here. Big yeah, player for us. Loved it here, uh -huh. I genuinely believe that he had stayed fit. We could have we could have sustained a, a right challenge that season because we were up there. I think we took 31 points out of 33 or something. And then he got injured. And he was, you know, we had a lot of brilliant players. I mean, we had Scatchel who was as good as any player I'd ever worked with. Really, Score right? Score for anywhere. So Scadjo could have played uh, in the 9-8 team and stuff like that? Easy. He, he, he needed to be one player I'd have took for the 2012 team into the 98 squad because he was he had, he had was different. He would get goals for midfield but he could score for anywhere. And he, he was a, he finished like Robbo. It was all left left okay. foot right. And he would use his right now and again but it was brilliant. And uh, but, but Big Kev was the the focus up front and he had a great partnership with Sleeve, Stephen Elliott. Uh -huh. It was him that recommended Stephen Elliott Aye, to Jeff. That was uh -huh. his mate at Sunderland. Uh -huh. <laughs> but to be fair, when Sleeves came in, Sleeves was brilliant for us. He, uh, You could see that he had played at the top level, you know, the way he used his body, he scored a, a lot of important goals for us. And the two of them had a, they already had an understanding because they'd obviously played together. Um, so they did brilliant for us and we had a really, really good squad then. Uh, you had a great first full season, finishing third. Aye. And then Jim loses his job, is that quite bizarre? <laughs> It was bizarre, but you know, no, it wasn't uh, anything, too surprised anything out of the norm here because we'd got into Europe and as I say, we lost Kev that season. If he had stayed fit, we probably could have challenged. Um, and the gaffer had done a brilliant job here. Uh, but as Vladimir did, you know, he... Was that your only meeting with Vladimir, sir? Is that the only time you spoke to him? I met him a few times. I met him a few... I didn't see him very often because obviously he was never here. I think at the time I came back to the, to the club, he was at the stage where I think he was kind of thinking about 
selling it or moving on. So he kind of lost the, the interest he probably had at the, at the early start of his time at Hearts. So we, we did not obviously face some of the problems I think previous managers had faced with him trying to interfere with team selection and signings and all that. But he did have a, a wee bit of a say, uh, which we tended not to try and listen to him, you know, because we were like, we can't let him derail what we're trying to do here. And because we all knew and we all accepted kind of how he worked, we just got on with the job in hand, which was, was difficult at times, but in the main, you know, we had a great group of boys um, and we just tried to get on with the job. And Paolo Sergio comes in. Brilliant. Was he good, was oh, he? Oh, legend. Legend. <laughs> he suits oh, far too big for him, Brilliant, isn't he? honestly. <laughs> I learnt so much under Paolo and he's, he's, he has, he's become like a big brother to me now. Right? You know, I speak to him all the time and it was completely different to obviously the gaffer and Billy. Um, he was completely different. Everything was, the training was different. I mean, the first thing he did, he cancelled the weddings days off, which was the Norman Scottish football, as, as you know. He felt that was the most important day to train. Uh, a lot of the training sessions were organisation, walking through things. You came in in the morning, everything was written down on a bit of paper. So it was up in the dress rooms. All the boys knew exactly what we were doing at training. They knew what colour of bib they were wearing. They knew where they were supposed to be. Um, and, you know, tactically and all that, he was he was outstanding. Were you a wee bit devastated that he stopped the Wednesdays off then? I was, I was got to my Tuesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he did, he liked a few beers in that pile, so we, we certainly made up for that on a, on a Saturday. So were you basically his only pal over here in Scotland? So no, he brought, he brought his two assistants, eh, Cabral and Serge, who were great, but see when they first came in, you know, they were saying, like, dead pan faced and that, and I'm thinking, oh, oh, no. is he going to like want me here for a start? Uh, so, first day, brilliant, I went in to meet him, I said, listen, welcome to Hearts, listen, uh, Gary Locke, I don't know if you, he says, I need you here. He says, I've not got a clue about Scottish football. He says, I didn't know the players, I didn't know the teams. He says, and my English is good, he says, but it's not great. I says, well, don't worry, I says, I'm on the same page with you there. <laughs> I says, but, like, you know, you know all the players, you know the teams in Scotland, all the rest of it. He says, you're going to be, you know, basically one of my other assistants. He says, I'll lean on you heavily. And for day one, we really, really hit it off, you know, Got on brilliant with him, it was a great management team. And the problems that we faced that season really it brought us you know, a lot closer Close together, hand. especially off the pitch. Because you said that the problems, obviously the players weren't oh, getting paid. How hard was that to get boys honestly, mate, it, was a, it was a nightmare. And it irks me now, because I hear a lot of Hearts fans and they say, oh, Paolo Sergio, he should have done better. And I'm like, you name me anybody in the world that does a job and doesn't get paid for five, six months, that would do it to the same magnitude as they would do it if they were getting paid every week. Because we were coming in here, and obviously I was the link as well between Paolo and the players. I'd gone to the dressing room, and the place was the place was a shambles. There were boys, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you, you get paid good money. But we had boys here that were, they were getting good wages, but they weren't the, they weren't the wages that could make you retire when you finish playing. And, you no, know, they went five, six months, and then you get to Christmas, you get to, you know what it's like, you're buying presents for your kids, you're buying presents for your, your wife, your girlfriend, your mum and dad and that. Both wife and, and you're not getting that. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not getting money coming in. And, you know, the boys were got six months where we didn't get paid anything. And eventually, you know, the boys are like, they're coming in and they were brilliant. You know, I, I can't speak highly enough of that squad, because they were coming in, Ian Black went away painting, and... Because we were in breach of contract, because we weren't paying the boys, we couldn't say, right, you're not doing that. He's like, I, I need money. He says, I, I, I've got to get money here. So he went painting hang for a week and then came in on the Friday, trained, played on the Saturday, and you're like, can credit to him Fair for doing play, that? Yeah, huh? Because as he said, he says, I need money to pay. Because you know what, it's like you earn that slightly more money, you've got a better car, you've got a higher mortgage, you, you maybe spend a wee bit more. All right, all the boys had to rein it in in terms of what they were they were spending, but it was genuinely we didn't know as a management team. Can they're coming to us every day, and you felt terrible because we couldn't we couldn't give them any answers. So how how do you keep how do you keep it at the same level? And what did you just manage to do? We just tried. There was days where we we had a training session organised. It was maybe shaping up the team, all the stuff that you know that players do tend to find quite boring. Mm -hmm. But we're like, you know what, we can't do that today. We just have to go and have a a wee fun morning with five aside, things like that. And just try and get the boys a wee bit a wee bit more bubbly, a wee bit more lively. And it was difficult. I mean, I love a laugh and a joke. Even I found it difficult lifting the boys through that period of time. 
and it was credit to them, you know, we went out and we'd, all right, we finished, I think it was fifth that season, but it was a miracle that we won that cup. No doubt about that, because these boys went through so much that season. Loads of different, different things happening that made it really, really difficult for us as a backroom staff, and the most important thing being that we couldn't give the players really any answers to what they wanted to know. You know, answers to. Yeah. Because they're saying to us, when is he coming across? Don't know. We could never ever get a hold of him. And then when he did come across, you know, it was it was the biggest kick in the teeth ever because he would always speak to the players through an interpreter. Now we went on for a while and then the interpreter just went, Vladimir will pay you when he feels like it. So it was like and then you had boys. Did you ever feel like banjo on him there? Oh. Uh -huh. Well, they've it there. I knew I'd go home, my dad would be hanging from the garage. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looking at that, thinking, he's not a guy to be messed with. Uh -huh. Because obviously, he is a uh, high profile guy in Lithuania. He's a big, big businessman. You don't know how things work over in these countries. And we, we, didn't, we genuinely didn't get answers to anything. So we were very much in limbo for three quarters of that season. And then, uh, going into the game against Hibs. Now, Ryan McGowan said that Paolo Sergio would always kind of like downplay these games yeah. and you'd be behind them like that. Oh, it was, obviously, it was the build-up to that is something that I've never experienced in any Edinburgh derby because, all right, you, we'd beat them four times that season and even throughout my career, you played against them, it was three points. But this was, this was a game that whoever won it, the other side of the city were never, ever going to get to forget. And in the build-up to it, I mean, it was incredible. I met me, Billy was obviously assistant manager at Hibs, and he wanted a couple of tickets for the Hearts End for a couple of his mates. So I went to see him, and everybody in the city was on edge that week. I went to meet him with the tickets, and this guy's come from anywhere. He said, what are you fucking doing? You better not be telling him our team. And I was saying, God, he says, hold on a minute, pal. I says, I'm just giving him a couple of tickets for our end. Is that all right? He says, no, that I need to explain myself to you. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, that's all right then, that's all right. But that's what everybody was like. And it was like, we stayed here. And I thought, at the time, I, th I no, I never argued with Paolo, but I thought it was a bad idea. I thought we should have went away somewhere and got away from the euphoria, you know, Edinburgh. The team had been not realised how big it was, is that no, why? No, I think he knew how big it was because he had experienced the derbies. Obviously, I'd sat and t told him everything about the derbies and that. And he'd been involved with Benfica against Sporting Lisbon and Sporting Lisbon against Porto and that. So he knew what the derby meant. But I just thought, you know, Hibs had went away to Ireland, I think it was, Pat and Billy had took them away to Ireland and got them away out the road. And I thought that would have been a good idea. But basically, Powell says, no, no, I want them to sleep in their own beds. I want them to be relaxed. We'll train here, because you know what it's like, you play Hibs, there's always somebody who'll watch your watch training you, session or they'll have somebody try to watch us. And that was a good thing about us. I can't name my sources, but we, we had a great idea of their team on the Monday well, did you, right? before we played them. So we kind of, we knew, we had a rough idea how they were shaping up. So you were up. setting up all week against We were that setting team. up all, all week against what we thought, well, what we'd been told that they were going to do. And, uh, Who told you that big guys oh, O'Connor? I can't, I can't <laughs> 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 uh, So, we, we worked on things that probably influenced our decision to play Suzo instead of Temps that day because we knew that they were playing a diamond, they were going to be narrow, and we knew if we had two wide men getting at their fullbacks, uh, that we could cause them a problem, especially with Gowser getting followed one side, Danny on the other. Um, so we had worked on num num numerous things, and Paolo used to let me crack on with the set pieces, so I was glad that we scored for one of them. Gowser got his usual two-yard tapping in the final, uh, in a derby rather. Uh, so it was it was brilliant, it was brilliant. Would, would, see, before a game like that, would Paolo Sergio speak, and then would you speak aye, after aye. it? So he would have so a tone down there. His team talk was, off, right lads, play the, play the game, then he play the occasion. You know, it's, it's another derby. But you've got, you know, we need 11 players on the pitch, or the usual, and I'm like, I, I totally agree with you, Gaffer, 100%. And he'd be like, right, okay. I'm like, right. Uh, honestly, I agree with everything the Gaffer's saying, but I'm telling you, this will be a war. You better fucking win your battle. You better win yours. You need to get wired in. Be sensible, but get make sure they know they're in a game. Because it's a derby. You've got to win the war first before you win the game. And uh, obviously, I'm hyped up as well, because being a jammer, we can't... Lads, we cannot get beat today. If there's one game we cannot cannot lose in my whole lifetime, this is the one. And because they hadn't won a Scottish Cup for so long as well. And, and that's it. And in the build up to the game, you know, that's that's what you were obviously. I, I know a, a, a lot of Hibs fans in, in the Edinburgh, and they're saying, you know, we've not won it for this amount of time since 1902. The first time we're going to win, it's got to be against Hearts. It's written on the 
stars and all this type of stuff and I'm like and I'm at the back of my mind I'm going right am I going to Turkey my holidays or am I going to Siberia you know what I mean it's like <laughs> it was that bad uh, and luckily for us you know on the day everything everything came to fruition uh-huh. where does that rank in your career? Oh, that's up there that's up there because can you enjoy it as much as a coach? I enjoyed that I enjoyed that probably no more than 98 I enjoyed it in terms of I felt that I'd contributed me because I'd played a huge part in the set pieces that season. Tactically that season, you know, Paolo would say, what do you think of this? Obviously, I'd found out the Hibs team, so we had worked on name playing a diamond and we, you know, I worked really closely with the backroom staff. So we all played, no, Sergio and Cabral. keeping the boys' spirits up as keep well. Keeping the boys' yeah, spirits yeah. up. But Sergio and Cabral, enormous credit as well, because, you know, we, all, we were a really close-knit backroom staff. But we all felt, and I, me personally, I felt I'd played a, a bigger part in that final because I never played in 98. But in that one, you know, I had a big influence on a lot that we, we did that day and I had a big influence on the boys as well in the dressing room. So it was uh, it was unbelievable satisfaction. And the celebration after it, a couple of the Hearts boys tempo and uh, oh, man. Big McGowan totally said you were sneaking beers on ah, the back and then was, back to Woodburn, was it? But what I'd, what I'd say is, if we win this the day, I know it's Hibs, but I'm going to make sure that I... I savour this one because obviously I'd got myself that Steaming miraculous in the 98. Couldn't remember much. 2006, you know, I was a fan against Gretna, so it was the same way with the boys that day on the supporters bus. Had a, you know, a fair bit to drink. So this one, I was like, I've played my part here, I'm going to enjoy it. So we, obviously we didn't have to wait that long after the game. We come back to Gorgie and it, it was different because they were more organised because we had won it a couple of times, the barriers and that were up. And uh, I just had two Coronas on the bus, sat with Rudy on the way back, go back to Gorgie, it was the same, fans were all gone mental. We had a great night here at night time. Uh, but I enjoyed it, can I wasn't I wasn't drunk or anything, I head. just enjoyed it. And uh, Paolo was like, he liked a beer. And he's like, hey, what's what's gonna happen tomorrow? And so I was telling him, listen, we get here, we can do the city chambers and that, you'll love it. This is gonna be the best day of your life. So he gets to the city chambers and he's like, right lads. No, take it easy here. You can go and do whatever you want later on, but you know we're going to see the Lord Provis. Be respectful on that. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. We're going down here for a drinks reception, so the boys are, you know, they're mere entitled to have a beer, having just beat Hibs five yeah. one. So we get there, and Paulo's had a couple of sensible beers. Gals and that are all having a beer, and then he's taking it off them and basically saying, right, just calm down. Then I wait till we get back to Tin Castle. I'm at. Don't worry about it, lads. Like Lord Provis, you know, a couple of crates. Eh? So I'm feeding all the drink out to everybody. <laughs> Had a great time in there, and then obviously the open deck bus. That was unbelievable. Just again. as good as 98? Just as good, aye. Uh, it's something, even, for, even for, oh, I speak to the lads here now, I'm saying, can you win a trophy, lads? You, you will not believe how good it is. You know, the, the, the way that you'll get treated after it, because I've seen it myself. You know, we had a reunion with the 98 squad just what, six, six months ago. And even Gilles and that, saying, I can't believe we still get held in such high regard when we come back here. I says, that's because, you no, know, you're our, you're our heroes to the fans here. I says, you're our heroes of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and and can, that was one of the funny things. Like, you know, after I made my debut, getting gone off track a bit here, I'd played about maybe 30 games. And my mum came in, she's like, do you know think you should start taking the posters of Robbo and Gary McKay now off the wall? <laughs> she's like, get me getting rid of the Hearts bed covers and that. She's because you're actually playing in the same team as well. <laughs> And I'm like, ah, right, aye, all right. So I still stay with my time. Posters of hearts everywhere. Brilliant. Love hearing so stuff like that. Uh, it was massive. And and that's that was the one thing in 2012. The players, even when they come back now, they get treated unbelievably heroes. well. And everybody treats them like heroes, which they are. How, how did you end up taking Ryan McGill in that back to Was oh, it Bonnie? Was it Bonnie Rigg you took them back? Well, my mate that I was speaking about earlier, Gary McQuinney. Uh, so, as I say, me, him and me, Joke, have been tight for years. 14, 13, 14, all our lives up to any good and all that. So Gary had phoned me on the Friday night. He says, right, listen, I'm going to organise. He says, I'm hoping not to tempt fate here. He says, but Woodburn Miners Club, he says, it's massive. He says, Bonner and Rose's social club, that's no big enough. He says, I'm going to organise a party for the Sunday night. If we do the business, can you come and try and bring Paolo and maybe a couple of players with you? So I'm like, nah, I didn't bother doing anything stupid like that. That's just tempting fate. That will end up falling flat in our faces. So anyway, he goes and organises everything. Right? So on the Sunday, I'm like, right, lads, you need to come with me the night. He says, this has got to be unbelievable, this. So Gowser and Danny Granger, they, had went, they were doing their own thing. So I phoned them. I'd arrived at 
with, with Gary and that early on, the place was heaving. Um, uh, you're talking five, six hundred Hearts fans in this hall, disco and every place was bouncing. So they turned up, so I've went outside and I said, right, you're not going to believe this by the way, this is incredible, you could not move in the place. If the police had came in, they would have shut the place, yeah. didn't they? So as soon as they come in, we got treated like pop stars, eh? They were like crowd surfers <laughs> right onto the stage. And girls was like, fucking hell, what about this? This is unbelievable. And I'm like, honestly, mate, it's been like this for the last, like, two hours. It started, like, kind of four, and, four o'clock, and it, this was right through the night. Yeah. So they're up on the stage. You would Honestly, you'd think it was like, take that in concert. Jumping about daft. Everybody was hammered, like, apps, because they'd obviously been on it on the Saturday and like the, the Sunday. Sunday. And even to this day, I think Big Gowser and Danny, they say. Where did they stay at your house? Eh... Uh, Gowser's got a couple of mates that stay alone He's head. got a couple of mates? A couple I, of mates, I find that to believe So, uh, <laughs> I think he ended, they ended up staying there. But it was, uh, it was a night. night. It was unbelievable. And at King Day, that brought the season to a, a brilliant close, eh? Because we're like, we've done the business, we've managed to beat Hibs. But that night, it was just like a pop concert for like four or five hours. And needless to say, we all ended up having a good, good party. 2012-2013, uh, Sergio leaves, McGlynn takes over, and then loses his job as well. Yep. When did you first hear that you were going to get offered the Hearts job? I didn't have any inclination whatsoever because I was gutted, you know, because I worked really closely with John and I was gutted when he, when he left because he'd got us to the cup final and, you know, I certainly felt that he'd done enough. To, to merit, you know, Still, managing the team in the yeah. cup final. That was, you know, it was his team. Would, it was an up and do, down season, but he'd, he'd done a great job. And uh, obviously, when John left, um, I was I was gutted. Um, and then the talk was that Peter Houston was coming in as manager, and I thought, well, that's that's good because you know I've, what Houston was the first team coach here. I got on really well with Houston. Brilliant coach, brilliant manager. It's probably exactly what we're, what the club's needing after the turmoil again. A, a really popular figure leaving the club, uh, like it was like Jeffries and then John McGlynn, and I'm like, uh, and then all of a sudden I got pulled in and said, "You've got to meet you the manager," and I'm like, "What? Can I, I couldn't believe it?" And they're like, "You will be the manager," and in hindsight, when you look back at it, I was I was too inexperienced to be the manager, but it was the cheap option because I wasn't a, I wasn't on big money. And obviously the club, little known to me, but the club was on the on the brink of, of going. So you going never under. knew that at the time, though. Never knew that at the time. I sat down with them and kind of basically says like, "There's your budget. We want you to go and sign whoever you want." So I'm kind of I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't mind getting him in. I'm getting him in. Uh, and boy, they had just scored. I don't know about 30, 40 goals that season. I'm like, can kind of, I could get him to lead the line, get a goal scorer in, chance, got half yeah. a chance of doing all right, and then. Uh, the next again day, <laughs> next again day, I come in and he says, it wasn't anybody for Lithuania, it was Trevor Birch and Brian Jackson. And they're sitting going, like, we're administrators, we, this is how it is. And uh, I'll never, I'll genuinely never forget that day, the day I die. He sat me down, says, right, you're a big hearts man, you're manager of the club. The, the fans had just raised something like two million pounds uh, in a share issue, which disappeared. And this was only like five, six months after that. And he says, if we didn't raise 1.7, 1.8 million in the next two weeks, he says, the doors behind you will be getting shut. And it was like a dagger, yeah. dagger in the heart, I swear. Being a big jambo and that, I'm like, you, you could be kidding me, man. I knew, like, I, I, there were some of the things Vladimir did and me and the gaffer and Billy would sit and go, by the way, we can't afford that. We can't afford that wage. We can't afford that. We could kind of see it coming, coming uh, but at the same time, you're always thinking, nah, he's no, no, he'll come up with the money, uh, he'll, he'll sort it all out, and uh, the place imploded. It was unbelievable. So I went home that night, again, I was, a, I was an emotional wreck. I'm like, who can, my team no, might not be here in two weeks' time. You know, I've got three daughters, I'm like, you know, I want them to grow up watching Hearts, and all my family are jambos, this is our club. But, can, what do I need today here to, to help us survive? So, the next again day, I faced you know, hundreds and hundreds of media guys, STV, Sky, everybody, and I, I found it really, really difficult. But I knew I had to, I had to sort of be the voice of the club. And it was like, look, every fan that's been on the streets when we've paraded the cup, every fan that's got that extra wee bit of money, and I was well aware that fans had already gave us money, probably they never had. Says if you've got a spare fiver, we need it. And if we, if we didn't get it, we're, we're not going to be here. 
And I mean, the reaction after that is something that I've never, like, I never ever thought I'd see. And it just showed you just how, how loyal the Hearts fans are. And it made me, like, immensely proud to be a, to be a Jambo, because I had, it was, it was unbelievable, a wee six-year-old kid came out of the training ground with his piggy bank and gave, it was about £24.60 in it. Wow. And gave us his money, he says, I just want to have a team to support. And I'm sitting Is there that going, quite emotional? Uh... Oh, I was, I was, I'd, I'd gone. Can I wait upstairs, like, t tears were coming to fit, and I says, no, wee man, see when we get better, you're coming back in here. And there was loads of wee kids did that, but he was the first. So when things did get slightly better, that it was, it was a tough season, but when things were looking a wee bit better when Anne came in, I made sure that he came back in, spent the day with the boys, spent the day with Marcel and Billy and that. But that, in, in two weeks, I mean, the fans raised something like 1.8, 1.9 million pounds. Oh, yeah. And it just showed you what this club meant to so many people. And, you know, the fans and obviously Anne are the reason why we're sitting in, you know, probably one of the best stadiums in the country now, which is fantastic uh, to are see. Are you quite proud that you were the manager that managed to save the club? Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put it as I was the manager that saved the club. But at that time, I mean, I was the, time the, I was the manager in our most difficult period in the club's history. And I'd like to think that, you know, I, I, I donate to the foundation, I'm a, I'm, you know, I put money in to save our hearts when probably I shouldn't have done. But I'd like to think that I've played my part, but I, I've not played my part any more than any, any hearts fan that, that maybe can't come to the game but pays their foundation money every month. They're, they're for me, they're the real, you know, I get sometimes people say to me, oh, you're a Hearts legend. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a Hearts legend. I think that the fans that put money into this club religiously every month, they're the legend because they kept the club here and Anne, and obviously Anne Budge, who, if it hadn't been for her, you know, God knows what would have happened. What a woman, eh? Uh, just on the managerial front, uh, were you keen to keep the job permanently despite the chaos? Well, I knew at the start of that season, you know, I'll be openly honest, I was... Too inexperienced and too young to be the, the Hearts manager, but the way the situation was, it was an opportunity that, as a Hearts man through and through, I was never going to knock back. And we sat at the start of that season, and you know, no disrespect, like in the youth teams I played, and we won, we won everything. So we kind of showed that we were the best young players in the country. Darren Murray had done a brilliant job with the young lads here, and gave them a brilliant ground, and he was a great, fantastic coach. But they, were, they, they hadn't won the reserve league, you know, you know we got, we'd done quite well in the, the youth cup and that, but we hadn't really won the reserve league and they'd finished maybe third, third, fourth in the reserve league. So we were getting a group of young lads that had loads of potential, but they probably weren't the best group of young players in Scotland at that time. So we sat with the squad and I looked at the squad and like uh, me and Billy were openly honest with each other, with that squad, even without the 15 points, this is going to be a struggle for us. And my worry was, you know, I'm thinking, we've got Celtic to play, we've got Hibs to play. We are basically a youth team. We had Jamie Hamill, Ryan Stevenson, Jamie McDonald. They were three experienced players. Danny Wilson was captain at 20, 21, I think he was. All the rest of the squad were like 16, 17, 18. Tough. And they weren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. They weren't ready for it. But we had no other option but to put them in the team. At the start of the season, it was like brilliant fre freshness about us. They were all in, they, were, they did quite well, we had a d reasonable start. And then like any young player, a lot of them took a dip. And we were like, what do we do here? We've just got to, you know, every Saturday night I'm scrapped, we've been beat, we got annihilated with Celtic here. Which was always a worry of mine, because I thought, you know, if Celtic turn up the day and we didn't, we could be, be on the end of hammering, which was what happened. But what we done is we just worked with them every day religiously. We spent hours on the training pitch with them. We tried to get them fit. Dave Sykes did a great job, made them physically better. And by the end of the season, I took enormous satisfaction out of seeing them kind of go from kids to adults. And you know, your Jason Holtz, Jamie Walkers, Big Callum Patterson, uh, they all then, for me, became kind of first team players. And then we beat Kilmarnock here 5-0, which, which gave me and Billy huge satisfaction because we played we pace, we passed it well, we got forward well, we scored a few goals. It was quite exciting to watch. Um, and then at the end of the season, obviously, I moved on, but I took enormous satisfaction for how these young lads had finished that season because uh, they had started to fulfil some of their potential. And some of them, you know, they went on to different things. And we knew some of them weren't good enough, but mm -hmm. we had no option but to put them in, and, and they handled themselves brilliantly. Even though relegation was likely at the start, was it still devastating? Oh, it was still hard to take. Uh -huh. 
because obviously you didn't want to be a manager that, Takes that goes down. But without the 15 point deduction, we would have been you know, level way, I think it was Hibs. Mm. So it was, it, it didn't give me any satisfaction, but I was satisfied in as much that I don't think, you know, I look back on it and I don't think there's anything that I would have changed. You know, I tried to do everything that I possibly could. In that season, we were still fighting for being here as a club, so I attended every every single charity night that I could. I went to every fundraiser that I could. I spent hours and hours on the training pitch. I, I went and watched games all over the place. You know, I never spent any time, you know, in the house or that. Was it draining? Uh -huh. Oh, it was draining. Aye, it was draining. There was some nights it was it was hard. Especially when we were, we had a couple of games where we got beat and you're thinking, God, they've made the same mistake as they did last week. Are they learning? Are they taking it in? All that. And then you're also saying, well, I can't sign anybody. I've got the same group of boys next week. So I need to keep their confidence. What we've got to do, uh -huh. you, you've got to go in on a Monday and lift the spirits, but there isn't really anybody to lift you. Uh, and that's where I found, uh, you know, Andy Prime, the club chaplain here, he was great. Charlie Chaplin, I call him, but he was brilliant. <laughs> He, he was just somebody him, you, just huh? somebody different to speak to. You know, I spoke to obviously my family and uh, everybody that was close to me, but just a different different voice sometimes. It was just a great great release for me sometimes where I could just get, get things off my chest um, and then go back onto the training pitch the next day and, and be as bubbly as what I normally was. Uh, you said Dan Budge taking over. Uh, were you interested in staying on as manager? I would have I loved to have got a, a shot when everything was better. Because you know, obviously then we had, a, we had a wee bit of money behind us uh, and I'd got the club kind of out of administration and, and it was time for the club to move forward. But, you know, there certainly there wasn't any bitterness. You know, Anne came in and uh, Craig came in on the football side and, and decided to go down a different route. That's football. You know, it was, it was hard. It probably would have been easier for me if it wasn't hearts. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, you know, it did, it did hurt for four or five months. Uh, but I was really, really fortunate that in that summer, Alan Johnston had phoned me up to to ask me to go and be his assistant at Kilmarnock, and that was a that was a brilliant opportunity. Uh, and obviously, being tight with Alan as I was, uh, I seen that as a, a, a brilliant opportunity as well. So you know, Hearts then made an appointment, and they moved on and done brilliantly that season. And you know, I went to Kelly with, with Alan. Uh -huh. uh, he then went on to manage Kelly, Rafe, and Cowden Beef. Uh, have these experience put you off management or you want to get back in it? Aye, it's put you off. <laughs> nah, listen, I loved, I loved my time in management and you know, in football you didn't know what's around the corner but there is a lot of things I didn't, like, I, I didn't miss at all. Politics uh, and all that Politics, stuff, uh -huh. unbelievable. People that, you know, some people that you think you can trust and as a first team coach, as an assistant, everybody's your mate. The minute you become the top man, you see a difference in a lot of people. Really? Uh, and that's one thing I didn't miss. And, and any manager will tell you that. Yeah. Any manager that, that says to you they didn't have problems at their club and that, they're, they're lying because it's it's a hard, hard gig now. And I, I genuinely take my heart off to all the, the, the modern day managers because the amount of stuff, we're no all perfect. And I'm certainly no perfect. And I know that I've made mistakes uh, and there is you know, clubs I'd rather, things had went a wee bit better and what have you. But some of the rubbish you've got to put up with now, uh, it's a thankless task at times. Is that the frustrating thing for a manager? Like fans are so quick to criticise, but they don't really see what's going on behind the scenes. Aye, I, I, I would love for fans to be able to go and see just how hard a manager works and a backroom staff works because okay, a lot of people, they see you on a Saturday and think, oh, you just take the training and then that's you. But there's so much goes on at a club. Okay, there's so much you've got to do. There's so much you've got to do for the players nowadays, especially... There's all different other things, all you know, things that you probably shouldn't be having today, but you do. And uh, you know, managers work work their tails off. And, and all right, it doesn't happen for some of us. It doesn't happen for some of the coaches and that. But it's certainly no for the lack of trying. You know, trying. And you know, I, I, I laugh with my old man and that all the time. And I say, all the best players in the world sit in the pub. And it's true. Kind of like the fans want to appoint the next you know, whenever Craig decides to move on, point the next Hearts manager, she'd be better going into the Bonner of the Grove Social Club. Because <laughs> they all know what the problems are with Hearts. See, when you were the manager, just, just the last bit, see, when you were the manager, would your dad be... Oh, he'd be better. Would you, what would you put him on for? <laughs> would you do that? But it was good. They, as I say, my, my, my close family and all my mates and that, they, they got right behind me. And it was, a, it was difficult. Even when I went to Kelly, it was difficult. Wraith, it was difficult. Cowden Beath was difficult. 
But, you know, I can always put my hand on heart and say I tried my best. And for me, that's, that's all you can do. If you try your best and it doesn't work, then you just hold your hand up and say, you know what, it's not for me. But if it, when you do get the fruits of winning things and, and people coming up to you and, and referring to you as a legend and things like that, they're the days that make everything, all the worthwhile. garbage days, worthwhile. And can, through football, I've, I've met loads of great people. Can very, very, what I could count on one hand, the amount of people that I'd probably say I didn't like. Probably yeah. mostly fickle man. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, as I say, I love my time there. Uh, and it was a great kid. Billy Bowie, I'm over the moon for him now. Because Steve Clark's went in there and what, okay, what a job he's done. Yeah. He's done an absolutely unbelievable job. But for people like, you know, Billy Bowie, who puts his money where his mouth is, who takes the stick for the supporters that he shouldn't be taking, uh, and Bud here as well. The job that the, these people do for football clubs is, is nothing short of incredible, and I'm delighted to see them doing, doing really, really well. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. Loved Cheers. it. All right. Top man.